R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 1 through 9. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 1 Lee is given an impossible assignment. During the terrible months Lee had been in Western Virginia, mountains had broken the winds of contention and distance had kept from him the worst alarms. In South Carolina and in Georgia, engrossed in the details of a difficult defense, he had heard little of the confidential news that came only to the President and to the War Department. Now that he was back at the storm center of the Southern struggle, consulted by Davis and having free access to the files, he soon learned the dark inwardness of a situation that had changed much for the worse since he had left the Confederate capital in November. Disaster was in the air. The defeats at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson had led the Confederates under Albert Sidney Johnston to evacuate most of Kentucky and part of western Tennessee. The newspapers that Lee read on his arrival in Richmond contained the gloomy intelligence that Fort Columbus, the advanced Confederate position on the Mississippi, 30 miles south of the confluence of the Ohio, had been abandoned by his old West Point friend, Leonidas Polk. There was danger that all the southern posts on the river, from Columbus as far down as Memphis or beyond, would fall to the victorious and overwhelming federal forces. Nowhere, since a small federal column had been destroyed at Ball's Bluff on the Potomac, October 22, 1861, had there been a substantial Confederate success on land to relieve the gathering gloom. Southern commissioners in Europe had not been received at a single court. Foreign intervention, which optimists had assured the country would certainly come by February 1, when the stores of cotton and tobacco would be exhausted overseas, seemed much more remote than it had been immediately after the victory at Manassas. The worst was not known, even to Congress. The Confederacy supply of powder was nearly exhausted. The arsenals were almost bare of weapons. Expected shipments of arms from across the Atlantic were being delayed by a blockade that was already demonstrating the silent, decisive influence of sea power, which the Confederates were powerless to combat. The army might soon be without the means to fight. Hope of relieving the blockade was raised for a day when the frigate Merrimack, cut down to the water's edge and covered with railroad iron, awkwardly steamed forth from Norfolk on March 8 as the Confederate ram Virginia and destroyed the Congress and the Cumberland, but she herself was challenged the next day by an ironclad as curious as herself, the Monitor. The faith of the public had fallen with the misfortunes of their cause. Gone was the old boastfulness that had humiliated Lee. Silent were the platform patriots who had predicted the complete defeat of the United States within 90 days after the first gun had been fired. The prophets had been confounded, the weak were despairing, the courageous were anxious. The South at length had realized, also, that the immensely larger manpower and resources of the North were being utilized in the creation of vast armies, perfectly equipped. In the Passion of 1861, hotheads had relied on Southern valor and had refused to concede that 23 million people had any advantage over an opposing 9 million, but now that the northern ports were receiving hundreds of tons of equipment from Europe, and northern factories were being made ready to supply everyone of any force that might be called into the field, the people of the South measured the odds against them accurately enough. Confederates no longer scoffed when indiscreet northern newspapers and occasional southern sympathizers who made their way through the lines told disquieting stories of the might and magnitude of the host that Lee's industrious friend of the Mexican campaign, General George B. McClellan, had brought together since he had taken command in Washington. Not only were the Confederates depressed and outnumbered, but they were preparing to abandon the lines that General Joseph E. Johnston had held, close to Washington, and almost on the frontier of Virginia, since the victory of Manassas eight months before. The news that Johnston was almost on the eve of a general retreat was the most alarming of all the secrets that Lee heard in the electric atmosphere of the President's office. Five times during the winter, attacks on Johnston's inferior force had been predicted, and with the coming of spring a great federal advance was certain. Lee himself, similarly placed at a later time, held to a policy of open maneuver, keeping the enemy as far from Richmond as possible and never abandoning the line of the Rappahannock if he could safely defend it. He probably would have declared for similar strategy had the choice been left to him now. Johnston's withdrawal, however, had been agreed upon at a conference between himself and Davis on February 20th. 
It was not Lee's nature to dispute what had already been determined by superior authority and was, moreover, virtually in process of execution. His observant eye must have discovered that the prospective movement was increasing the unhappy friction between Davis and Johnston that had antedated even the Battle of Manassas. The president had accepted the view that the army could not successfully resist a heavy offensive by superior forces that could use their sea power to land troops in rear of Johnston's right flank on the Potomac, just north of Fredericksburg, which Johnston believed they were preparing to do. The advantages of standing on the line of the Rappahannock River, in closer touch with the other forces in Virginia, had not been overlooked by the president. Yet no sooner had the withdrawal been sanctioned than the nervous Davis and the irascible Johnston disagreed as to the time it should begin and the necessity of leaving stores behind. Davis admonished, but Johnston kept his own counsel, determined to withdraw when and whither his judgment dictated. A week and more Lee spent in study of the general situation, without definite assignment to duty. On March 13 there were important developments. Davis then received his first official information that Johnston had evacuated the Manassas Line on March 8-9, had retreated 25 miles southward along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, and had halted his army on either side of the North Fork of the Rappahannock River. The same day, unknown to the Confederates, a Union Council of War at McClellan's headquarters decided on the line of advance for the vast Army of the Potomac that was now equipped to the last tent peg. And on that identical, Illoman 13th, Lee received an impossible assignment to duty. Behind it lay conflict between the President and Congress. The dissatisfaction of that body had been directed first to a campaign against Judah P. Benjamin, Secretary of War, who had been assailed for failure to send munitions to General Henry A. Hawise at Roanoke Island, and C. Benjamin had the most valid of excuses that there were no munitions to send. But both he and the President deemed it better to accept unmerited censure in silence than to expose to the enemy the weakness of the South. The attack on Benjamin was so bitter that it manifestly would soon force the President to supplant him, but that was not the only grievance of Congress. Mr. Davis's disposition to direct military operations in person had provoked much criticism. Antagonism to him had been growing for some weeks, though cool heads had sought a compromise. Reasoning that the first need was a new Secretary of War, and that the President had confidence in Lee, Congress had passed an act providing that, if a General of the Army were appointed Secretary of War, he would not lose his rank. This was a direct invitation to Mr. Davis to appoint Lee. When the President duly had signed the measure on February 27, it was immediately assumed that Lee would be named, but the President concluded that a soldier would not make a good Secretary and made no appointment. Instead, he asked in effect that Congress provide him with two secretaries, one civil and one military, and that legislation creating the post of commanding general be enacted, so that the appointee could act, in a sense, as military or technical head of the War Department. Congress acquiesced, but in drafting a new bill, the president's enemies seemed to have had equal hand with his friends. When the measure was finally laid before him, a few days after Lee's return, it provided for a commanding general, directed the president to nominate such an officer to the Senate, and authorized the officer so named to take personal command of any army in the field at any time. Again, it was expected that Davis would name Lee, but the president saw in the move an invasion of his constitutional rights as commander-in-chief of the army and navy. Personal affronts he might swallow, with more of grace than was usually credited to him, but strict construction of the organic law was a matter of political conscience, for which he would do battle even if the enemy's divisions were at the doors of the capital. On March 10, the bill came to him. Within three days, his political experience had suggested a means of maintaining his rights as commander-in-chief and of accomplishing the desired object. He vetoed the measure and simultaneously assigned General Lee to duty at the seat of government, charged under the direction of the president, that phrase asserted his authority, with the conduct of military operations in the armies of the Confederacy. Congress perforce sustained his veto and promptly re-enacted that part of the original bill providing his staff for the general so designated to duty. Davis thereby won a tactical victory and followed it up by reorganizing his cabinet on March 17, naming Benjamin as Secretary of State and placing the War Office under George W. Randolph, a grandson of Thomas Jefferson and a very popular Virginian. Lee's ability as an administrator gives interest to speculation as to what might have happened if he had been named Secretary of War, but his new position was manifestly difficult and anomalous.
The Charleston Mercury said that he was being reduced from a commanding general to an orderly sergeant. Lee himself said, It will give me great pleasure to do anything I can to relieve the president and serve the country, but I cannot see either advantage or pleasure in my duties. But I will not complain, but do the best I can. Few of his friends congratulated him, they knew too well the embarrassments Lee had to anticipate. Once appointed, Lee was not given an hour in which to organize his staff or to add to such understanding of the situation as he had been able to get from a brief study of the tangled records of the adjutant general's office during the interval between his arrival in Richmond and his assumption of command on March 14. Every mail told of some added menace to southern arms. The telegraph clicked off an endless report of new calamities. People, press, and politicians, in a spirit as dark as that of the dripping, mournful weather, demanded action far beyond the feeble resources of a bewildered war office. The duties of the post were to prove vexing and varied and were never to be finished. He could not know when the president would call him to a long, futile conference or what new problem from an unfamiliar field a hard-beset commander would present by telegraph with a plea for instant answer. One hour he might be puzzling over a complicated and obscure situation in Tennessee, the next he might be expected to advise which heavy guns should be moved from a Florida post and where they should be sent. Some dispositions were to be left completely to him by the president. Other matters Mr. Davis was to handle in person or was to take from him, half completed. Within less than three months he was to be called upon to pass, in some form, on operations in every southern state, and was besides to discharge some of the duties of the Commissary General and Quartermaster General. Broadly speaking, Davis entrusted to him the minor, vexatious matters of detail and the counseling of commanders in charge of the smaller armies. On the larger strategic issues the President usually consulted him and was often guided by his advice, but in no single instance was Lee given a free hand to initiate and direct to full completion any plan of magnitude. He had to work by suggestion rather than by command, and sometimes, when he picked up a task that had been assigned him and then transferred to someone else, he was required to correct errors by swift action. Some public men were quick to see the good he accomplished, but in the hearts of others jealousies were aroused. Sensitive spirits were encountered. Public confidence in his qualities as a commander was not what it had been in 1861. In his whole career there was not a period of more thankless service, but there were few, if any, during which he contributed more to sustain the Confederate cause. Chapter 2 The Concentration on the Peninsula It had been Lee's singular ill fortune to assume each of his previous Confederate commands in an atmosphere of disaster. He had reached western Virginia when weary troops were still panting from an exhausting retreat. His arrival in South Carolina had been on the very day when the forts at the entrance of Port Royal Sound were being evacuated. And now almost the first dispatch that reached his desk announced that a strong federal expedition had descended from Roanoke Island on the important North Carolina town of New Bern, had swept past the feeble Confederate lines that protected it, and had routed the defending force of 4,000 men. This might mean much or little, but the main railroad between Richmond and the South Atlantic states passed Goldsboro, less than 60 miles inland from New Bern. The possibilities were so serious and the available Confederate forces were so small that the President authorized Lee to detach a few regiments from Huger's force at Norfolk and two brigades of infantry, with two companies of artillery, from the right wing of Johnston's army, and to dispatch them to North Carolina. General S. G. French was immediately sent forward to assume general command. For a day, it seemed as if Lee would be compelled to accompany the troops, but Mr. Davis directed instead that they should be under General T. H. Holmes, a native North Carolinian, from whose immediate command part of them had been taken. This detachment was a serious matter, because it weakened by more than 10 percent the strength of the principal Confederate army in Virginia and carried still further a deplorable if unescapable policy of scattering the troops that defended the frontier state and the capital city. There were at that time seven separate southern forces in Virginia under six commanders, none of whom was responsible to any of the others. If one imagines a semicircle drawn northward from the Virginia-Carolina boundary and extending from Norfolk to Bristol, the seven Confederate commands were spaced at irregular intervals roughly on the arc of this semicircle to meet anticipate attack from the east, the northeast, the north, the northwest, or the west. Beginning on the east, as of March 24, 1862, Major General Benjamin Huger had 13,000 Confederate troops in the Department of Norfolk.
This force covered the city and the captured navy yard, where several warships were on the ways. Huger also guarded the south side of the lower James River against any attempt to mask Norfolk. Although no federal army immediately confronted him, he was exposed to attack up the inland waterways from Albemarle Sound, North Carolina, which the Federals controlled. Across Hampton Roads, a garrison of some 10,000 Union troops under General John E. Wool occupied Fort Monroe and was in position to make a descent on Huger at any time that the Federal fleet could silence the Virginia. The second Confederate force, styled the Army of the Peninsula, lay at Yorktown and Gloucester Point, its outposts within three miles of Fort Monroe. Twelve thousand strong and commanded by Major General John B. Magruder, these troops had a twofold function, to defend the country between the York and James Rivers against a federal advance by land from Fort Monroe, and, secondly, to prevent federal ships from passing up York River to West Point, where they could land troops within less than forty miles of Richmond. The army that General Joseph E. Johnston had just withdrawn to the line of the Rappahannock was the third in geographical order and numerically much the largest in Virginia. Its left wing was west of the Blue Ridge, in the Valley District. Its right, which was entrusted to Brigadier General W. H. C. Whiting after the transfer of General Holmes, had been drawn back to Fredericksburg. The strength of this army varied from week to week with furloughs and sickness and probably was somewhat underestimated in Johnston's correspondence with General Headquarters. The highest figure for the Central Divisions, the main army, was 30,000, with an additional 7,000 under Whiting. This was the mobile, combatant force, weak in transport but well organized and fairly well equipped, though consisting largely of one-year recruits whose terms of enlistment were soon to expire. It had been located to prevent a turning movement from the Rappahannock, to dispute a federal advance, to cover Richmond, and to protect the Virginia Central Railroad, which formed the only line of rail communication between Richmond and the Shenandoah Valley. The strength of the great Federal Army of the Potomac, which was supposed to be confronting Johnston, was estimated by optimists at 150,000 and by pessimists at 200,000. The force in the Shenandoah Valley, consisting of 5,000 men under Stonewall Jackson, was a part of Johnston's army and subject to his orders. It was geographically isolated, however, and had virtually to operate separately because it faced the enemy on two fronts. It unsuccessfully attacked a part of the opposing Federal Army at Kernstown, near Winchester, on March 23, and on the 24th it halted at Woodstock. The enemy had not followed it from Winchester. Major General N. P. Banks, who was in general command in the valley, was attached to the Army of the Potomac in much the same manner as Jackson was to Johnston's army. Banks's strength was not known but was supposed to be much superior to Jackson's. West of the Appalachian Range, beyond the Shenandoah Valley, the federal command of Brigadier General W. S. Rosecrans lay potentially on Jackson's flank and rear. This force, which was soon to be transferred to Major General John C. F. Fremont, was scattered through western Virginia in unknown strength. Jackson's orders were to hold banks in the valley, but, in maneuvering to do so, he had always to keep in mind the possibility that Rosecrans would cross the mountains at one or another of several passes and would sever his communications with Staunton and the Upper Valley. The three remaining Confederate columns were small observation forces. West of Staunton, Brigadier General Edward Johnson with 2,800 men guarded the Parkersburg Road to Cheat Mountain of Unhappy Memory. In front of Lewisburg, leading into the Valley of the Kanaw, Brigadier General Harry Haight had 1,500. At Lebanon, Russell County, Brigadier General Humphrey Marshall with 1,500 covered the Virginia-Tennessee Railroad from attacks by raiders. Haight and Johnson, like Jackson, were based on the Virginia Central Railroad. An offensive that brought the enemy to that road would cut them off from rail communication with Richmond. All seven of these commands were under men who had received technical training as soldiers and had seen field service in the Mexican War. Except for Jackson and Marshall, all of them had continued in the United States Army until 1861. The majority of the brigade commanders also were soldiers by profession. Such was the distribution, not to say dispersion, of the Confederate forces shortly after Lee took nominal charge of the conduct of operations. Our enemies are pressing us everywhere, he recorded at the time, and our army is in the fermentation of organization. I pray that the great God may aid us, and am endeavoring by every means in my power to bring out the troops and hasten them to their destination. And the enemy, what would he do?
All agreed that he would assume the offensive speedily, for his numbers were vastly superior and his equipment was complete. At Johnston's headquarters, the belief was that Richmond would be the immediate objective by one of four routes, but there was no agreement as to which of the four would be adopted. The spies could discover little. Secret correspondence with Washington had been almost cut off. The cavalry could not penetrate far, though it was industriously led by Lee's former cadet and acting adjutant at Harper's Ferry, Brigadier General J. E. B. Stewart. To be in position to move quickly, Johnston withdrew a few miles southward on the 18th and put the Rapidan as well as the Rappahannock in front of him, but he was entirely in the dark as to the enemy's movements. Lee was no better informed. He suspected that an attempt might be made on the peninsula, but he did not believe a real offensive could be launched until the roads were firmer. If he knew how to profit by it, McClellan might have the priceless advantage of surprise. On March 24, 1862, Lee went, as usual, to his new office in the War Department building, formerly the Mechanics Institute, on 9th Street, opposite the western end of Bank Street. Very soon there came a sensational telegram from General Huger at Norfolk. More than 20 steamers, Huger reported, had come down Chesapeake Bay the previous evening and had begun to disembark troops at Old Point. A little later, General Magruder notified the Secretary of War that he believed the force confronting him had risen to 35,000. Magruder did not suggest that the troops had come from McClellan's army, nor could Lee be sure, but by the next morning the information in hand rendered it probable that the new arrivals belonged to the Army of the Potomac. If this were true, Lee had to consider three possibilities. 1. McClellan might have detached the troops to cooperate with Burnside in North Carolina. 2. The new troops might have no connection with Burnside's movements and might be designed to join with the 10,000 already at Fort Monroe in an attack on Norfolk or up the peninsula, while McClellan advanced on Richmond from the north. 3. The reinforcements at Old Point might be the advanced guard of McClellan's whole army, which was preparing to march up the peninsula. In dealing with these three possible movements, it was not enough to draw a line and defend it. Norfolk could readily be cut off, as Lee had pointed out during the mobilization of Virginia. The peninsula afforded at least three good defensive fronts, drawn from river to river, that could be held by an alert force against odds, provided the James and the York were not opened by the enemy. But if the attacking Federals used their sea power wisely and passed the batteries on either of these streams, they could land in rear of the Confederates. This condition had led Lee, in April, 1861, to put the obstruction and defense of the rivers first in his program and it was an important factor in his strategy now. The appended sketch will show the Confederate defenses on the rivers and the exposed position of the army on the peninsula. The time element was of even greater importance. The army must not be thrown into an active campaign, if this could be prevented, until the reorganization then in progress had been completed. Time was likewise needed to raise, to train, and to move forward other troops. Weighing all the circumstances in conferences with the President and the Secretary of War, Lee developed a plan that is a most interesting example of provisional reconcentration to meet an undeveloped offensive. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about this plan is that it was devised and put in process of execution within 36 hours after Lee received news of the landing at Old Point. He had no doubt been canvassing the possibilities for days, but the actual decisions, which could not be made until he had some inkling of the enemy's plan, were reached with great promptness. The course he chose was this. 1. Holmes's force in North Carolina was to be strengthened, so as to occupy Burnside, if possible, and to prevent his advance into North Carolina or his cooperation in any operations against Norfolk. 2. Both Huger and Magruder were notified to prepare their forces so that Huger could help Magruder if the attack were on the peninsula, and Magruder could assist Huger if Norfolk proved to be the federal objective. 3. The ironclad Virginia could cover the mouth of the James River and prevent federal interference with troop movements by Magruder or Huger of Confederate forces across that stream, but she was then in dry dock at Norfolk. Pending her return to service, Lee undertook the improvement of the water batteries on the James, accumulated transportation on the river, and selected a point above the probable reach of federal gunboats, where the infantry could cross. For the scanty available reserves, a couple of regiments of infantry and some squadrons of cavalry then around Richmond were at once ordered to Magruder.
5. To give time for the reorganization and for the collection of new troops, Magruder was urged to stand on the first defensive line on the Lower Peninsula, the line farthest from Richmond, and was instructed not to evacuate it voluntarily unless the Federals were able to turn it by carrying their gunboats up the York or the James. 6. In case the lines on the Lower Peninsula should be turned from the James or the York, Magruder was directed to prepare for a withdrawal to the third defensive line, that of the Chickahominy. In doing this, Magruder was to destroy the river landings. He was, moreover, to use his artillery on the river banks, as far as practicable, beyond the points covered by the water batteries, in order to prevent the passage of the enemy high up the James or up the Pamunkey, the southern of the two streams that formed the York. Lee's experience with this type of defense on the South Atlantic seaboard gave him a faith in it that was not possessed by those who had not seen how readily the federal gunboats were deterred by such measures as these. 7. The enemy must be kept as far down the peninsula as possible, at least until his full plan was disclosed. It might not be possible to do this with the force Magruder had, or with the reserve that could be sent him. Lee accordingly decided, with the president's approval, on this major movement, he would withdraw the greater part of Johnston's army from the Rapidan, would move it quickly to the lower peninsula, would attack the Federals there, and then, if need be, would return Johnston's troops to their old position. Lee believed the situation in Northern Virginia would make this possible, without excessive risk of losing Richmond, because he reasoned that so large a part of McClellan's army had already been transferred to the peninsula that McClellan would not quickly advance on Richmond from the north with the forces left him. Johnston was asked what force he could dispatch to Richmond for this purpose and was instructed to be prepared for orders directing an immediate movement of his army. This was a bold plan to be formulated by an officer who had been at his post only a fortnight. It displayed the facility that Lee always exhibited in strategy, even from the beginning of his career in responsible command, and it embodied all that he had learned in South Carolina and in making dispositions for First Manassas. Execution, however, was not so easy as conception. Obstacles and objections were encountered in such numbers that the plan had to be revised almost as soon as it was formulated. Magruder held a council of war which decided, in something of a panic, that unless 10,000 reinforcements could be at once dispatched to that front, Yorktown should be evacuated. Lee reassured Magruder, cautioned him against over-large councils of war, and urged him to stand where he was as long as possible. Magruder acquiesced, and that tangle was straightened out. It was otherwise with Johnston. He was a sworn devotee of concentration and he argued that all or none of his army should be transferred to the peninsula. Soon he reported that Jackson was threatened by superior forces and that the enemy showed activity on his own front. Several days exchange of correspondence with Johnston convinced Lee that his old friend would not willingly fall in with his plan. Then, for the first time, Lee displayed a quality of mind that was to become one of his greatest assets as a commander. It was this, he would make the best, for the time, of what he could not correct, but he would hold to what he believed the sound strategy and would look to time and circumstance for an opportunity of executing his plan. If Johnston would not consent to the dispatch of enough troops at one time to strengthen Magruder, Lee would take what Johnston would give him immediately, would extemporize, and then would get more as soon as he could. He exhibited, in short, a patient persistence in attaining his object. Patient persistence, indeed, was to become the measure of the man in many a difficult hour. It is interesting to see how Lee applied this policy. In place of a speedy general movement, he effected a series of small transfers to the peninsula. Johnston was willing at the outset to detach only two brigades. One of these was sent to the peninsula, the other went to North Carolina. As Magruder needed much more than this reinforcement, Lee ordered one of Huger's brigades to be ready to cross the James and send two Alabama regiments to Yorktown. He even dispatched 1,000 unarmed men to Magruder, in the hope that Magruder could give them, if necessary, the guns of soldiers then in hospitals. This was the best he could do for them. Not even old flintlock muskets could be supplied from Richmond. The arsenals were stripped of all arms that would fire, and preparations were being made to manufacture and issue pikes. To this desperate plight had the battling Confederacy been brought. During the march of these troops to Magruder's support, the Federals made no demonstration against his lines.
This aroused Lee's suspicions and led him to apprehend that the real objective of the enemy might be Norfolk rather than the peninsula. He accordingly began to strengthen Huger's little army and called for two of Johnston's brigades to be employed on the peninsula at Norfolk or in North Carolina as the situation might demand. Either at Lee's suggestion or on his own initiative, Magruder all the while did his utmost to discourage the enemy both from attacking his line and from detaching troops for operations against Norfolk. Physically magnificent, though burdened by a curious lisp, Magruder had a certain innocent element of bluff in his makeup and could readily deceive a hesitating opponent. Working busily on the construction of the defenses and on the damming of Warwick River, which covered his front, he kept his troops in motion. One day, as if massing for some desperate business, he sent a column into a wood through which there ran a road in plain view of the Federal outposts. Hour after hour, the Federals could see his gray troops emerge from a thicket, cross the road, and vanish again in the pines. The Federals must have counted thousands of files and must have wondered for what evil purpose so many brigades were being massed, but Magruder in reality was simply marching a few men in a circle, like an army of supernumeraries on a stage. It was said of Magruder, Prince John, they called him in the old army, that when war did not trouble, he delighted to dress a scene and to appear, a dazzling figure, in amateur theatricals, but rarely did he play a part so much to his country's good as in those anxious days at Yorktown, when Lee did not know how large a part of McClellan's army remained on the old battleground in northern Virginia or how many divisions were preparing to take ship for Hampton Roads. Thus, for a time, all was well on the peninsula. Whatever the enemy's plan there, he was slow in developing it. In northern Virginia, and in the Shenandoah Valley, the situation was obscured by doubt. Jackson reported the enemy advancing against him and called for reinforcements. Johnston, alarmed, detained one of the two brigades already ordered to Richmond and prepared to send half a division to Jackson if necessary. It seemed as likely on April 4 that the main offensive would be in northern Virginia as on the peninsula. That same day, however, Lee received news through General Stewart that a flotilla of transports was underway down the Potomac for some unknown destination. Simultaneously, word came from Magruder that heavy columns of Federals were moving out from Old Point in his direction as if to give battle. Lee concluded immediately that the two reports were related and that McClellan was moving more of his men to the peninsula, but as Lee still was uncertain how large a part of the Army of the Potomac remained in Johnston's front, he decided for the time being not to attempt to send the remainder of Johnston's forces to Magruder's support. He continued, however, to order detachments until, by April 4, he had called a total of three divisions from the line of the Rapidan Rappahannock. It was done so quietly and so gradually that few protests were made. These transfers, coupled with minor reinforcements to Magruder from other quarters, gave that officer the prospect of having a total force of 31,500 by April 11, while Johnston was left with four divisions, roughly 28,000 men, including Jackson's 5,000, in the Shenandoah Valley and Stewart's 1,200 cavalry. This daring, piecemeal reconcentration was a matter of the greatest delicacy, the success of which depended on maintaining the morale both of Johnston and of Magruder, while interpreting accurately the very scant available information of the enemy's movements. If Lee underestimated the strength or the initiative of the Federals either in northern Virginia or on the peninsula, Johnston or Magruder might be overwhelmed before help could be sent. A simultaneous attack on both, in such numbers as the Federals were known to have in the state, would inevitably be disastrous. And if disaster came in Virginia, it meant ruin everywhere. For while Lee was in conference with Davis, hour after hour, calculating the risks on the Rapidan, in the Shenandoah Valley, and in Hampton Roads, the rival armies of Grant and of Albert Sidney Johnston were grappling on April 6-7 at Shiloh, near the Tennessee-Mississippi boundary. The Confederate press claimed a victory on a hard-fought field, but the losses were heavy and Johnston was killed. Island No. 10, a Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi, was captured on April 8, with 7,000 men. The bold bid of the South for the control of the Upper Mississippi had been rejected by the fates. There was imminent danger that the Confederacy would be split in twain and that the Federals would then proceed to break up the riven halves. How could the South be saved if Virginia were lost? The troops sent southward from the Rapidan moved steadily to the peninsula, where the enemy was placing batteries and bringing up heavy artillery for a siege, but showed as yet no disposition to assault. No general advance of the enemy in northern Virginia was reported.
the threat against Jackson had not materialized. Several days passed without a new crisis, but by April 9 Magruder was satisfied that the greater part of the Army of the Potomac was in his front. A minister who had escaped from Alexandria, Rev. K. J. Stewart, confirmed this indirectly by giving a very accurate account of the departure of federal troops and of McClellan himself from that city. Risks would be taken, of course, in acting on this information, but an inferior force had to take them. On April 9, doubtless with Lee's full approval, the president made the final move in the reconcentration, ordered Johnston to report in Richmond, and directed that his two strongest divisions, Longstreet's and G.W. Smith's, be set in motion for the capital. Ewell's division of some 7,000 or 8,000 men was left on the Rappahannock to observe the enemy and to cooperate with Jackson, whose division of 5,000 was slowly increasing in numbers. One brigade of Smith's command was left temporarily at Fredericksburg. By this time, it was understood from northern newspapers that the Federals remaining in northern Virginia were under Major General Irvin McDowell. Thereafter they were usually styled McDowell's army, but of their strength and position very little was known. When Johnston arrived in Richmond, his command was enlarged to include Norfolk and the peninsula, and he was directed to visit that part of the front to see his problem at first hand. On April 13, he left. The next morning, Lee received a summons to come to the president's office. When he entered, he learned that Johnston had returned unexpectedly and had made a disheartening report. The president was so much concerned that he had called a council of war, to which he had summoned Lee, Johnston, Secretary Randolph, and Major General Longstreet and Gustava Smith, the two last named at Johnston's instance. Discussion of the greatest moment followed. Johnston pronounced the situation at Yorktown an impossible one. The line, he said, was entirely too long for the force defending it. Magruder's men were beginning to show the effects of strain. Inundations that had been prepared along the Warwick River might hold off McClellan on the land side, but they would likewise render an offensive by the Confederates impossible. The superior Union artillery would soon batter down the southern batteries covering York River, and when that happened McClellan's gunboats and transports could pass up the stream and turn the Confederate position. The most that could be done on the lower peninsula would be to delay McClellan temporarily. It would be better, Johnston went on, to discard the plans under which they were operating, to abandon Norfolk and the peninsula, to concentrate in front of Richmond all the troops in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia, and to strike McClellan at a distance from his base. As a less desirable alternative, he proposed that Magruder stand siege in Richmond while the other Confederate forces carry the war into the enemy's country. The Secretary of War promptly opposed this change of plan because it would necessarily involve the evacuation of Norfolk, where the Virginia was based and where other ships were under construction. To lose Norfolk was to give up all hope of creating a navy to cope with the federal sea power. Lee was then asked to express his opinion. An early withdrawal, to his mind, would bring the armies dangerously close to the nerve center of the Confederacy and would complicate the reorganization then in progress. It would likewise make heavy fighting inevitable before the full armed strength of the South was in the field. From the lower South Atlantic coast a brigade or two might be spared, but no large reinforcement could be expected immediately. Fort Pulaski, the outpost of Savannah, had fallen just three days before. Losses in Tennessee had forced the War Department to send to that state six new regiments raised in Georgia and four from South Carolina. Stripping the South Atlantic coast of men, as Johnston proposed, might involve the fall of Savannah and of Charleston. On the other hand, Lee had faith in the line on the Lower Peninsula, where with his approval, if not on his initiative, the inundations of which Johnston complained had been affected. He believed that invaluable time could be gained by delaying McClellan there as long as possible. Lee and Randolph argued against Johnston and Smith, with Longstreet saying little and Davis reserving judgment. The debate was continued with warmth until supper time and after an hour's intermission was kept up until 1 a.m. the next morning. Then Davis declared himself in favor of defending the Lower Peninsula. It was undoubtedly a sound decision.
Had Johnston's plan been adopted, Ewell would have been called to Richmond, Jackson could not have won the Battle of Winchester the next month, the federal troops remaining in front of Washington would have been available to cooperate with McClellan, and Johnston, in all likelihood, would have been defeated in front of Richmond or would have been compelled to uncover that city. The Confederacy could hardly have survived long. In a more limited sense, Davis's decision in overruling Johnston had a direct effect on the operations of the next six weeks. Johnston made no protest at the time and seemingly acquiesced in the orders of the commander-in-chief, but he was of the same opinion still. Long afterwards he recorded, the belief that events on the peninsula would compel the government to adopt my method of opposing the federal army reconciled me somewhat to the necessity of obeying the president's order. He prepared, in other words, to go to the Yorktown front in the conviction that he would soon fall back on Richmond and would leave the president no alternative to that of bringing all possible forces from the South Atlantic seaboard for a battle near the capital. Three days later, on April 17, Johnston assumed his new command. Lee's part in the reconcentration was done. Operations on the peninsula and the conduct of affairs at Norfolk were thereafter, until May 31, entirely under Johnston's direction. The only Shirley had in events that followed on those sectors was general supervision of the preparation of defenses near Richmond, particularly on James River, and the tender of such basic counsel on strategy as Mr. Davis sought. The military achievement of Lee in effecting the reconcentration speaks for itself. Despite his anomalous position, his had been the guiding hand in shaping a policy that had held the Yorktown line with trifling losses until Magruder's 11,000 were in a fair way of being raised to 53,000 without any advance by the enemy south of the Rapidan River. Here, as on the South Atlantic coast, he had benefited by the extreme caution of his opponent. How much of that caution was due to the temperament of McClellan, and how much was dictated by sound dispositions that might have been mismanaged by a Confederate commander less capable than Lee, is a question that cannot be answered. As if to dramatize the reconcentration, part of Longstreet's division and some of the cavalry marched through Richmond on the day that Johnston took command on the peninsula. The infantry had made their long march afoot, often along muddy roads. They styled themselves for the time Longstreet's walking division, and one of them grumblingly wrote, I suppose that if it was intended to reinforce Savannah, Mobile, or New Orleans with our division, we would be compelled to foot it all the way. At the sight of their soldiery, people who had been close to panic took heart again. The infantry moved down Main Street, the cavalry clattered along Franklin. It was the first anniversary of the secession of Virginia, a perfect spring day. The gardens were all abloom, the whole city was at the curb. Along with the best refreshments from their pantries, the women brought out to the sidewalk their jonquils and their hyacinths until the smell of grease and powder and unwashed men was subdued by the odors of flowers. Laughing boys took the blossoms from outstretched hands as they tramped eastward and stuck them in their caps and gun barrels or strung them about their necks until the gray columns took on lively colors. The bands kept playing Dixie, My Maryland, and the Bonnie Blue Flag, and the people cheered and waved and grew in confidence at the sight of so many men, until those dark words Donaldson and Shiloh and Island No. 10 lost their terror for the day. Chapter 3, Lee and the Conscription Act If Lee looked out at Longstreet's men as they marched down Main Street that 17th of April on their way to the peninsula, he could not have been thinking of the flowers or of the cheers. His mind must have been on the size and number of the regiments. He must have asked himself what would be the probable effect of the law the president had signed the previous day. Would it fill the ranks that were soon to be decimated in the slaughter that everyone now foresaw? Ever since the early winter, he had been looking forward with the deepest concern to March and April, when the men who had clamored to join the colors in the first fervor of secession would come to the end of their twelve months enlistment. Many, of course, would continue in service, but a sufficient number would leave the army to reduce its strength most dangerously. At the beginning of the campaign, he had written in December, when our enemies will take the field fresh and vigorous, after a year's preparation and winter's repose, we shall be in all the anxiety, excitement and organization of new armies. In what different condition will be the opposing armies on the plains of Manassas at the resumption of operations? He had seen no way of meeting this condition except by conscripting the manpower of the South, and as early as December 26, 1861, it will be recalled, he had written Governor Letcher advocating a general draft in Virginia of all soldiers who did not re-enlist. 
President Davis had advocated a like policy for the entire Confederacy but had encountered the opposition of extreme states' rights politicians and both in and out of Congress he had faced the inertia born of the belief that European countries would intervene to stop the war before another campaign opened. Not until December 11, 1861, had legislative action been taken and then the law had been fashioned to please rather than to strengthen the army. The poor measure adopted was known as the Bounty and Furlough Act, and it demonstrated, as Ropes aptly remarked, that the difference between an army and a congeries of volunteer regiments was not appreciated. Every soldier who re-enlisted for three years or for the duration of the war was promised a bounty of $50 and a 60-day furlough. He could choose his arm of the service, and if he did not like his company, he could join a new one. There was nothing in the law to keep an ambitious soldier from canvassing discontented men in established regiments to enter new units where the solicitor hoped to win a commission. On the re-enlistment of the army, the men could elect their own officers, rewarding those who curried favor by laxity and demoting those who had enforced discipline. Once the elections were held, all commissioned vacancies in every regiment were thereafter to be filled by promotion, with the proviso that when new second lieutenants were to be named, they should be elected from the company in which the vacancy existed. A non-commissioned officer, therefore, who discharged his duties vigorously and aroused the antagonism of the indolent and the shirker, could be sure that when a new lieutenant was to be chosen, he had little chance of receiving a bar on his collar as a reward for performing his duty but was much more likely to be passed over for some popular private. A worse law could hardly have been imposed on the South by the enemy. Its interpretation was confusing, its effect was demoralizing, and it involved nothing less than a reconstruction of the entire land forces of the Confederacy in the face of the enemy. Upton did not err when he said later that the bounty and furlough law should have been styled an act to disorganize and dissolve the provisional army. This mischievous measure had been enacted before Lee had returned to Virginia from the South Atlantic coast and its evil consequences were only too apparent when he assumed nominal control of military operations. There had been nothing he could do about the existing law. He had been compelled to wait until necessity should convince Congress that if the South was to survive the casualties of even that single year, a sterner policy was demanded. With the Virginia troops, the case had not been quite so discouraging. Moved by Lee's appeal from South Carolina, Governor Letcher had induced the General Assembly of the Commonwealth to provide in February for a general enrollment of all citizens between 18 and 45 years of age. From the list so provided, 40,000 militia had been called to the colors on March 10, in response to a requisition from the War Department and the Confederate commanders had been authorized to use these men in any temporary emergency. Replacements of militiamen were to be drafted to take the place of 12 months troops who declined to re-enlist for the war. But these latter troops were not allowed to leave the service. Upon the expiration of their terms, they passed immediately into the militia, and, as all the militia had been embodied, Lee announced on April 11, in his capacity as commander of the military and naval forces of Virginia, that volunteers who fell into the militia on their failure to re-enlist could be drafted at once, as far as practicable into the same companies to which they had lately belonged. In this direct fashion, Virginia adopted compulsory service. Her regiments were in no danger of being wrecked by the reorganization. Between the time the bounty and furlough law was enacted and the date of the conscription of the Virginians whose terms were expiring, Congress passed a series of weak and hurried measures designed to increase recruiting with the bait of further promises to the men who re-enlisted. These acts failed to affect any general re-enlistment. Within little more than a month after Longstreet's division marched through Richmond, the terms of not less than 148 Confederate regiments would expire. There was, as the Secretary of War subsequently reported, good reason to believe that a large majority of the men had not re-enlisted, and of those who had re-enlisted, a very large majority had entered, new, corps which could never be assembled, or, if assembled, could not be prepared for the field in time to meet the invasion actually commenced. Seeing no way of preventing the disorganization of the army except by conscription, Lee made himself an opportunity, even during the crisis that followed the landing at Old Point on March 23, to review the subject fully with the new lawyer member of his staff, Major Charles Marshall of Baltimore. 
Lee maintained, said Marshall, that every other consideration should be subordinated to the great end of public safety and that since the whole duty of the nation would be war until independence should be secured, the whole nation should for the time be converted into an army, the producers to feed and the soldiers to fight, a principle that in 1917 America wisely adopted. Marshall was directed by Lee to draw up the heads of a bill providing for the conscription of all white males between 18 and 45 years of age. The finished paper Lee tipped to the president, who approved its principles and had it put into shape by Mr. Benjamin. Introduced in Congress, the bill was amended and mangled. Provision was made for the election of officers in re-enlisted commands, and most of the other useless paraphernalia of the Bounty and Furlough Act were loaded on it. The upper age limit was reduced from 45 to 35 years, and a bill allowing liberal exemption was soon adopted. The press had applause for the object of the bill and sharp words on its weaknesses. In the army, those who had intended not to re-enlist on the expiration of their terms grumbled and charged bad faith on the part of the government, but those who were determined to carry on the war to ruin or independence rejoiced that those who had stayed at home were at last to smell gunpowder. In the well-disciplined commands, men who went home at the expiration of their twelve months and returned as conscripts soon settled down to army routine. The election of new officers resulted in the defeat of many good soldiers and in the choice of good fellows in their places, but, on the whole, the elections wrought less evil than could reasonably have been expected. For his part Lee realized the danger involved in reorganizing the army to the accompaniment of federal bullets, but he read in the law a promise that recruits would ere long fill the regiments which passed down Main Street that day, and for that promise he must have been grateful. It probably never occurred to him that chief credit for the Conscript Act was his own. Chapter 4 The Genesis of Jackson's Valley Campaign The enactment of the conscript law and the assumption by Johnston of command on the peninsula did not lessen Lee's labors. They simply turned them into other channels. More time was allowed him during which to study a military situation elsewhere that called for the best judgment the administration could exercise. Affairs on all the fronts were tangled and on some were desperate. Lee was called upon by the president to advise regarding the movements of the army in northern Mississippi, the command of which had passed to Beauregard on the death of Albert Sidney Johnston. In East Tennessee, a small force under General Kirby Smith was in the deepest need of equipment and reinforcement, and the task of helping it was assigned to Lee. The few scattered regiments in western and southwestern Virginia were threatened by superior federal forces, unable to send more men, Lee could only urge a slow withdrawal to strong natural positions and the best preparation of the ground for defense. To Lee, also, was given the difficult role of diplomatist in dealing with Governor Brown of Georgia, on his shoulders fell part of the burden of apportioning such arms as reached the Confederacy from abroad, on occasion he helped in the work of the Commissary and Quartermaster General. From West Florida and Alabama, from the Trans-Mississippi, then and thereafter, came calls for reinforcements and appeals for instruction. An unpleasant controversy involving Ripley and Pemberton at Charleston had to be relieved, as far as practicable, a little later. In dealing with all these distant operations, Lee laid down the sound principle, expressed in a letter to the commanding officer in Florida, that where he did not know the particular necessities of a local situation he could only make general suggestions and would not send definite instructions. His chief attention, after April 17, Lee gave to operations in northern Virginia and in the Shenandoah Valley. When Johnston had left the Rapidan, he had directed Jackson and Ewell to communicate with him through the adjutant general's office. The president evidently reasoned that Johnston would be engrossed in operations on the peninsula and that the campaign north and northwest of Richmond could be managed more promptly and satisfactorily from the capital than from Johnston's headquarters. No formal orders were issued and the nominal command of Johnston over Ewell and Jackson was not reduced, but dispatches from them were referred to Lee, evidently with instructions to supervise the movements of these two officers as long as Johnston was at a distance from Richmond. It was a most embarrassing arrangement. Johnston was excessively sensitive on all that touched his authority. Lee had to defer to the chief executive, as always, while avoiding offense to Johnston. He had to fashion operations of the utmost gravity, but with no assurance whatsoever that he would be allowed to complete the strategical combinations he might undertake. His work, in short, had to be one of tactful substitution, now for Davis, now for Johnston.
It was pressing work, too, because important changes had occurred since Johnston had marched from the Rapidan, leaving on that line and at Fredericksburg only a thin detachment of observation. The strength of the Federals under McDowell in northern Virginia was still unknown, but was assumed to be great. On April 21 this army, or a large part of it, was believed to be debarking at Aquia Creek, north of Fredericksburg. Its advanced guard, estimated at 5,000, had reached the Rappahannock opposite that city. In its front was only Field's Brigade, about 2,500 men, which had withdrawn 14 miles south of Fredericksburg to get behind streams that were then very high. 47 miles west of Fredericksburg, at Gordonsville, lay the greater part of Ewell's division, now 8,500 strong. This force was the mobile reserve designed to be moved eastward to Fredericksburg or Richmond or across the Blue Ridge to support Jackson, as required. At Swift Run Gap, 25 miles northeast of Staunton, Jackson had 6,000 men, in the face of General N. Pete Banks, whose strength in the Shenandoah Valley was not known but was thought to be much in excess of Jackson's. Detachments from Banks and from McDowell were vaguely reported at various points between Winchester and Manassas Junction. Among them Field, Ewell, and Jackson had 17,000 men from east to west over a front of 83 miles. The only troops then available in Virginia, outside Johnston's enlarged command east of Richmond, were the three insignificant forces covering the roads from western Virginia, Edward Johnson's 2800, Haight's 1500, and Marshall's 1500. Marshall was at too great a distance to help Jackson. Haight probably was too remote. Edward Johnson's little command on the Parkersburg Road had been compelled to withdraw close to Staunton in the face of Milroy's advance guard of Fremont's army, which was believed to outnumber it very greatly. Johnson was more apt to need help than to be able to render it. On April 21, the Federals had the greatest opportunity the war in Virginia was to offer them until the late winter of 18641865. Correspondingly, the Confederate position was one of acutest danger. The odds against the troops north, west, and northwest of Richmond were even greater than the Confederates supposed, 65,000 to 24,000. If Banks and Fremont occupied Jackson and Ewell, then a sudden thrust across the Rappahannock by the force under McDowell would of course overwhelm Field's little command. Richmond would be only 60 miles to the southward, less than five easy marches, and McDowell would be on Johnston's line of communications before that officer could return to Richmond. Indeed, a quick attack by McClellan might mean the destruction of Johnston ere he could reach the defenses of the capital. Even if the federal armies were not then capable of launching four offensives simultaneously, it seemed almost certain that McClellan and McDowell could unite in front of Richmond. They could invest the city from the north, the east, and the south and either reduce it with their superior artillery or force the immediate retreat of Johnston to North Carolina. Thus the least result of vigorous, joint action by the Federals would be that they would soon occupy the whole of Virginia, and the reasonably attainable outcome would be the decisive defeat of the one formidable army then under the southern flag. The downfall of the Confederacy by midsummer was a distinct possibility. Johnston and Lee were both alive to this danger, but they took fundamentally different views of the best method to meet it. Johnston changed his proposals from time to time, as was natural, but, generally speaking, he continued to urge that concentration be met with concentration, that as McClellan and McDowell were almost certain to form a junction, they should be allowed to advance to a great distance from their bases and should then be attacked by all the Confederate forces from the Rapidan to the Savannah. Lee's strategy, on the other hand, reduced to the simplest formula, was not to meet concentration with concentration but to occupy the Federals on the peninsula and to undertake an offensive defensive in northern Virginia that would prevent a federal concentration. Lee's was the bolder policy, but in a long view it was the more prudent course. It was better to keep the Federals away from Richmond than to attempt to fight a battle there, much less to stand a siege. Knowing the strength of the North, Lee never willingly accepted investment in a fixed position. His study of Napoleon warned him of the danger of such a course. He sought always to keep the enemy at a distance from his base, and when a siege was threatened, his impulse was to avoid it by a counterstroke. If a siege was inevitable or the enemy was concentrated in a single army, then, of course, Lee was as insistent as Johnston could have been on the fullest possible concentration.
because great stakes hung on the throw, and because troop movements in Northern Virginia from April 17 to May 25 represent the first development of some of the most distinctive methods Lee was subsequently to employ, the student of war will find interest in every line of the correspondence that now opened between Lee and the commanding officers on the Rappahannock and in the valley. Lee's fundamental problem was to prevent the reinforcement of McClellan from any quarter. Immediately, as he saw it, the point of danger was Fredericksburg, where McDowell might establish a base for an advance to McClellan's flank. The Rappahannock City was so feebly defended that Field's little brigade could not retard, much less halt, a federal offensive. Before anything else was done, therefore, the Fredericksburg line had to be strengthened against demonstrations that might show the weakness of the defending force. Lee felt out Johnston to search if that officer could release any of the troops recently sent to the peninsula, but was assured that this was impossible. Reinforcements had to come from elsewhere. Lee could not strip the Carolina and Georgia coast, as Johnston had suggested, but, as he had no other source from which to get men, he adopted the expedient of calling for small forces from several quarters, on the theory that he would not take enough men from any army to destroy its powers of resistance. In case it were attacked, the force from which he drew reinforcements would still be strong enough to hold out until he could replace the men he had ordered elsewhere. Like a hard-pressed debtor, he had to borrow where he could to meet his most pressing obligations, trusting that, if his new creditors became troublesome, the future would bring the means with which to repay them. Already, on April 19, Lee had ordered to Richmond one regiment from North Carolina, one from South Carolina, and one from Georgia. Now, as Burnside was quiet on the North Carolina coast, Lee decided to take the chance that he would remain so, or could be delayed if he attempted to advance. He accordingly ordered to Virginia Anderson's brigade of 4,000 from Holmes's North Carolina Army. From South Carolina, Gregg's fine brigade of 3,500 was called, and a regiment was scraped together around Richmond to complete it. In this way the force at Fredericksburg, which was to pass to the direct command of General Joss R. Anderson, would be raised to 13,000 men by April 28, or about that time. Pending the arrival of Anderson with these reinforcements, Field's orders were to preserve a firm front to the enemy, to keep yourself accurately advised of his strength and movements, and to communicate anything of importance that may occur at once to this office. 13,000 troops on the Rappahannock manifestly could put up a more formidable resistance than 2,500 could, but they could not prevent an advance by such an army as McDowell was rightly assumed to command. Something more must be done. Either enough additional force had to be gathered on the Rappahannock to resist McDowell successfully and to prevent his union with McClellan in front of Richmond, or else McDowell had to be held north of the Rappahannock and deterred from advancing. Only the 8,800 of Jackson and Edward Johnson in the Shenandoah Valley and Ewell's 8,000 at Gordonsville could be counted on for either purpose, and they, of course, were threatened by Banks and Fremont. Lee promptly decided how he would utilize these troops in the crisis. On April 21, before any of Field's reinforcements had reached him, Lee wrote one of the most historic of all his military dispatches. It was addressed to Jackson. In it, Lee outlined the situation in front of Fredericksburg and suggested three possibilities. First, if Jackson felt that he could drive Banks down the valley by calling up Ewell's division, he was advised to do so. This, said Lee, will prove a great relief to the pressure on Fredericksburg. If, secondly, Banks was too strong to be attacked and Jackson thought that Ewell should be in supporting distance, it would be well to place Ewell between Richmond and Fredericksburg, that was to say, in front of the line of the Virginia Central Railroad, near Hanover Junction, whence he could be moved with equal speed by rail to support Jackson, Field, or even Johnston, in case the battle went against the Confederates on the peninsula. If, in the third place, Jackson believed that he could hold Banks without assistance, then Lee recommended that Ewell be made ready to reinforce Field. In a word, instead of waiting for Fremont and Banks to crush Jackson and Ewell, while McDowell disposed of Field and moved to unite with McClellan, Lee proposed to anticipate all of them, to take the initiative, and so to occupy McDowell that he could not advance from the line of the Rappahannock. I have hoped, he wrote Jackson four days later, in the present divided condition of the enemy's forces that a successful blow may be dealt them by a rapid combination of our troops before they can be strengthened themselves either in position or by reinforcements. While submitting three plans to Jackson, over whom, it must be remembered, he had no formal command, Lee manifestly favored an attack by Jackson and Ewell on Banks.
In the course of his correspondence with the two Confederate commanders during the fortnight following the letter of April 21st, Lee wrote few dispatches in which he did not dwell on this possibility. When it seemed that Jackson could not attempt to assail Banks directly, Lee suggested that Jackson and Ewell advance east of the main federal force in the Shenandoah Valley and destroy Banks' communications either around Warrington or at White Plains in Salem. He was altogether for an immediate offensive defensive. The blow, wherever struck, must, to be successful, be sudden and heavy, such was his admonition. Jackson, at this time, did not feel strong enough to attack Banks, even with Ewell's support, unless Lee could send him 5,000 men. Lee could not do this, though he cherished a momentary hope of being able to dispatch hate to his support. As an alternative to an immediate offensive against Banks, Jackson proposed that he unite with Edward Johnson, who was being pressed back on Staunton. He could then attack Milroy, leading Fremont's advance force, Jackson reasoned, and if he succeeded in defeating Milroy, he could take Edward Johnson and Ewell, strike Banks, and then come east of the Blue Ridge to Fredericksburg or to any other threatened point. Doubtful whether it was practicable at that moment to attack Banks, Lee, on May 1, approved Jackson's plan for joint operations with Edward Johnson west of Staunton, but he kept reverting to the desirability of an offensive against Banks. Lee was willing that the offensive should be undertaken at Fredericksburg, if nothing else could be done, but he continued of opinion that the best way to hold the line of the Rappahannock was to strike in the valley. It has generally been assumed that, in urging this course, Lee was actuated by a conviction that he could play on President Lincoln's fears for the safety of Washington. Those who argue this do so in a knowledge of facts with which Lee could not possibly have been acquainted at this time. After the Battle of Winchester, Lee discovered that President Lincoln would make almost any military sacrifice and forego any offensive plan in order to save Washington from the risk of capture, but in early May Lee's strategy was based on military considerations only. He believed that an advance down the valley would so threaten the communications of an army operating north of the Rappahannock as to keep it from advancing on Richmond. No evidence of any larger purpose than this, on Lee's part, can be adduced as of this date. Lee's dispatch of May 1 to Jackson, authorizing him to use his discretion in attacking Fremont west of Staunton, marked the end of the first stage of the preliminaries to Jackson's renowned Valley Campaign. Jackson silently marched away on his mission to join Edward Johnson west of Staunton and, after his wont, entrusted neither to the mails nor to the telegraph any intimation of his purpose or his progress. Lee had to wait, and wait not less to see his judgment of Jackson vindicated than to see their joint strategy work out. For Lee was gambling on Jackson as well as on the veteran McDowell, the adventurer Fremont, and the politician soldier Banks. Jackson did not then have great reputation. His personal appearance was all against him. Cavalry boots, covered feet of immense size, a mangy cap with visor drawn low, a heavy dark beard, weary eyes were his. Stern in his discipline, uncommunicative in his dealings with his officers, darkly Calvinistic in his manner, this strange young soldier of 38 was regarded by some of his comrades as eccentric to the point of madness. Ewell confided to his friends that Jackson was insane beyond all doubt. His hard marching during the previous winter had created much ill will against him. Ashby, who commanded his cavalry, obeyed his orders but would not permit him to organize, much less to discipline, his troopers. The Romney campaign and the Battle of Kernstown were accounted defeats that had effaced the distinction he had won at Manassas. Yet Lee from the outset saw in Jackson qualities that some overlooked or discredited. He had not forgotten Jackson's work at Harper's Ferry when he had been able to communicate with him as soldier to soldier and not as deferential diplomat to sensitive individualist. To Jackson's discretion he had now entrusted operations that immediately affected the whole strategic plan for saving Richmond. The laurels of many a man of larger military reputation than Jackson had already been withered in the heat of that war. Would the new operations against Milroy justify Lee's judgment of the man or repeat the fiasco of Romney and the half-defeat of Kernstown? Chapter 5 The Battle Brought Closer to Richmond Affairs were more desperate than ever when Lee made his gamble on Jackson and that strange man led his regiments mysteriously away into the mountains. Admiral Farragut on April 24 passed with his fleet the forts guarding the Mississippi, and the next day captured New Orleans, the largest, richest city of the Confederacy. Civilian Richmond trembled to think that what had happened in the Louisiana metropolis might be repeated on their streets. The Federals under Burnside waked up. 
On the 26th, they occupied Fort Macon, the evacuation of which Lee had previously urged. Signs were multiplying that Grant was preparing to launch an offensive against Beauregard in northern Mississippi. The news from the Virginia Peninsula was bad. Almost every message from Johnston after April 24 contained some hint of an early retreat from Yorktown, which he expected the Federals to turn with their gunboats as soon as they had silenced the batteries. In the face of strong arguments to the contrary by the Secretary of War, Johnston on April 27 had notified the President that he was preparing to abandon his position and had renewed his argument for a general concentration in front of Richmond. His dispatches had requested that bridges across the Chickahominy be constructed as rapidly as possible, an intimation that he purposed to retire close to the city. In a letter to Lee on the 29th, Johnston mentioned the evacuation of Richmond as a possibility that had to be considered. Then, on May 1, the very day when Lee sanctioned Jackson's move against Milroy, word came from Johnston that he intended to evacuate Yorktown on the night of May 2-3. Davis at once urged Johnston to delay his retreat long enough to permit the removal of the invaluable naval supplies from Norfolk, where Huger, by his own admission, was in a cul-de-sac. The Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy prepared to go to Norfolk to see what could be saved there. Lee did not lose faith, but even he was shaken and, as always, he looked to heaven for deliverance. We have received some heavy blows lately, he wrote on April 26, from the effects of which, I trust, a merciful God will deliver us. His was not a nature, however, to leave to God what man could perform. Still believing that the enemy could be delayed on the lower peninsula, he undertook to see if Johnston would not try to hold on a few days longer. Johnston had changed his mind about the general strategy and had reverted to the second of the two plans he had presented at the Council of War at Richmond on April 14, the plan, that is, for a general offensive across the Potomac instead of a concentration and battle in front of Richmond. Lee assured him the president was considering the feasibility of such a move to be undertaken at a later date of course, and the next day, May 2, he wrote Johnston again, explaining that time was needed to complete the evacuation of Norfolk and, if possible, to bring the unfinished gunboats up James River. Lee went on, all the time that can be gained will facilitate these operations. It is not known under what necessity you are acting or how far you can delay the movements of the enemy, who it is presumed will move up York River as soon as open to him to annoy your flank. His advance on land can be retarded, and he might be delayed in effecting a landing on York River until your stores are withdrawn. The safety of all your ammunition is of the highest importance, and I feel every assurance that everything that can be accomplished by forethought, energy and skill on your part will be done. If it is possible for the Virginia, which upon the fall of Norfolk must be destroyed, to run into Yorktown at the last minute and destroy the enemy's gunboats and transports, it would greatly cripple his present and future movements, relieve your army from pursuit, and prevent its meeting the same army in northern Virginia. It was in vain that Lee held out, in his final sentence, the possibility that the administration might ultimately approve Johnston's plan for a new offensive in the territory from which his army had withdrawn. Johnston had made up his mind that McClellan would soon silence his water batteries. He had been advised, moreover, that the pilots did not believe the Virginia could run past the Federal fleet in Hampton Roads and reach the York or enter Pocosin River in rear of McClellan's army. On the 4th came news that Johnston, without further notice to the War Department, had removed his whole army from the Yorktown line and was retreating up the peninsula. Simultaneously Lee received the ominous tidings that federal gunboats had passed up the York and had reached West Point, 37 miles from Richmond. Lee at once telegraphed to Johnston, tactfully inquiring if light artillery might be sent to the Pamunkey to prevent the federal ascent of that river from West Point. No reply came from Johnston, nor any report on his movements. The authorities in Richmond were at least as much in the dark as the enemy was, concerning the plans of the general, whose 55,000 troops were the chief reliance of the carefully. The day of the evacuation of Yorktown was a Sunday, when all Richmond went to church to pray for the army. As anxious worshippers started home, word spread that the sick from the lower peninsula were arriving and were making their way to the hospital at Camp Winder. Carriages at once were hurried to the street, wagons were hitched, Sunday dinners, uneaten, were sent to the hungry, muddy men. They could tell little of what had happened except that when they had been sent from Yorktown, the army was preparing to leave the heavy guns in position and to take the road toward Richmond. Monday, the 5th, 
brought rumors of a bloody action at Williamsburg, Tuesday confirmed the story and added dark details of a stubborn rearguard battle so closely contested that Johnston had been forced to leave his wounded in the rain and to hurry on without making a stand on the support line that Lee had drawn in front of Williamsburg. And still nothing official from Johnston. All that Lee could do, in the absence of any precise knowledge of Johnston's plans, was to prepare for a battle close to Richmond. Despite high water, he endeavored to speed the slowly progressing work on the James River defenses and channel obstructions seven miles below the city. From Norfolk, he sought to remove to Richmond the heavy guns that might supplement those already being placed to keep the enemy from ascending the river. He urged, moreover, that the Virginia hold the mouth of the river as long as possible to cover Johnston's flank on that stream. Lee's chief hope of saving Richmond he still pinned to the projected operations in northern Virginia. Looking beyond Jackson's attack on Milroy to his cherished offensive against Banks, he was scouring the seaboard for troops to reinforce Ewell, while Johnson's unhappy troops were marching up the peninsula with the enemy in leisurely pursuit. At last, on May 7, came a dispatch from Johnston, the first that appears in the published records bearing dates subsequent to the evacuation of Yorktown. It told of the presence of a fleet of ironclads and transports at West Point and of Johnston's apprehension for the safety of Richmond. There was no reference in the message to Johnston's plan of operations and no hint of any purpose to make an early Stanley had to draw his own inference from the fact that Johnston was then at Barhamsville, only 35 miles from Richmond, and mentioned that his army was moving in two columns, up roads that led straight to the capital. The only reassurance to be had from the paper was that Johnston held a position from which he could meet any offensive directed against his flank by way of York River. The next day brought even more disquieting evidence of the field commander's state of mind. His known and deplored jealousy as to his prerogatives broke out, most inopportunely, in a long, sharply phrased letter of many complaints, without his knowledge, he said, troops under his command on the south side of the James had been ordered about by Lee, he had not been informed concerning operations on the Fredericksburg front, nothing had been said to him as to the placing of obstructions in the Pamunkey, he had no control over work on the Richmond defenses. My authority, he said, does not extend beyond the troops immediately around me. I request therefore to be relieved of a merely nominal geographical command. The service will gain thereby the unity of command, which is essential in war. The feeling disclosed in this letter had been shown before by Johnston in smaller things, when the possible consequences of discord had not been so serious. After Bull Run, he had wrathfully refused to accept a staff officer because he thought Lee had no right to send him, and his grievance over rank had increased as he had meditated upon it. Truth was, Johnston possessed very great ability as a strategist and was in many of his impulses generous and warm-hearted, but his temper was apt to get out of control when he felt his authority was ignored. Although he was able to win and to hold the affection of his subordinates, he was suspicious, reserved, and wholly lacking in the arts of conciliation when dealing with his superiors. In this crisis, burdened with responsibility, and conscious that he did not possess the good opinion of the president, he appeared at his worst and was a most difficult man with whom to work. Lee, however, understood from old acquaintance that Johnston usually cooled as quickly as he boiled. Knowing and admiring the man, Lee had no intention of permitting Johnston's testiness to ruin a friendship of thirty-five years standing or to endanger a cause to which he knew Johnston was sincerely devoted. With patient tact, therefore, in a long letter, he smoothed down Johnston's ruffled sensibilities, explained all the matters of which Johnston complained, and ignored his request to be relieved of responsibility for the troops on the south side of the James. The incident, however, was a new warning of what might be expected in dealing with Johnston, and this, in turn, added to the difficulty of a situation that now seemed to be hurrying to a tragic climax. For Johnston's army had continued its retreat and now was less than 30 miles from Richmond and only 15 from the Chickahominy, the last natural barrier in McClellan's way. Stragglers were streaming into Richmond, some of the men who had thrown away their arms on the field of Williamsburg. On May 10 the Federals entered Norfolk, an irreparable loss, the valiant Virginia was blown up on the 11th, being unable to pass up James River and having no harbor, Huger was in retreat up the south side of the James toward Petersburg, destroying the railroad as he went. Federal gunboats were in the river, the defenses below the capital were still so weak that field artillery.
had to be hurried down to support the guns in fixed positions, panic had again seized Richmond and was driving hundreds southward, the archives were packed for removal and a conference was held on the disposition of reserve rations, committees waited on the president to know if he intended to hold the city and went away scarcely reassured by his calm announcement that he would. News reached Richmond that Jackson had won a victory over Milroy at the village of McDowell on May 8 and had driven the Federals westward from in front of Staunton, but this did not ease the mind of a public which did not understand that the battle was the auspicious preliminary to the fulfillment of larger plans. Jackson was declared too rash and a whisper that he was crazy when under excitement went the rounds. The president was bitterly assailed. Lee was criticized for what he had not directed on the peninsula and for what he could not now prevent. Had Lee been of a nature to heed criticism of this sort, he would not have had time to trouble himself with it. Every energy was bent on the preparation of the defenses at Drury's Bluff. That was now a more important position than even the line of the Chickahominy, toward which Johnston's columns were slowly marching. When Johnston finally made a stand and fortified himself, he could at least hold off McClellan for a time. But the federal ironclads were coming up the James, the lower defenses of the river had all been abandoned, nothing stood between the Union fleet and Richmond except the incomplete batteries perched there on the cliff at Drury's. A brief bombardment might decide the fate of that fortification and of Richmond any day the Federals saw fit to attack. All the resources of the breathless capital were requisitioned to finish the obstructions and batteries, if possible, before the enemy's ships hove in sight. The seasoned, confident gunners of the abandoned Virginia were sent to Drury's to reinforce the garrison. The crude machines that had been used to drive piles across the James were worked furiously. Ships that had been brought up from Norfolk were sunk below the bluff. A brigade from Huger's division was sent there by forced marches. Troops were posted on both sides the river to punish the incautious when the ships hove in sight. General William Mahone, as the most experienced construction engineer, was placed in charge of the defensive preparations. Twice the President and General Lee went down the river to examine in person the condition of the defenses. To them, to anxious Richmond, and to the panting engineers who battled with mud and high water, the work at Drury seemed to progress with torturing slowness. The chances of success or disaster appeared to be about even. While Lee was struggling to better the odds, the president had to consider what should be done if the enemy passed the batteries on the bluff. His courage was as staunch as Lee's own, but after what had happened on the York, he could not decline to ask himself how the army could escape from the front of Richmond in case of disaster and where it would make its next stand. The counsel of Lee was sought on this dark question. He was summoned to a cabinet meeting and was asked what line south of Richmond the army of Johnston could best take up if forced to evacuate the city. The answer was not difficult from a military point of view, the next good line was that of the Staunton River, nearly 100 miles to the southwest rather than to the south. Usually, Lee would have answered the president's question and would have said no more, but now his fighting blood was up. The army could occupy a good position on the Staunton if Richmond fell, but, he said, and tears rose in his eyes, Richmond must not be given up, it shall not be given up. His words were an amazement to men who had come to look on his self-control as invulnerable. I have seen him on many occasions, Postmaster General Reagan subsequently wrote, when the very fate of the Confederacy hung in the balance, but I never saw him show equally deep emotion. Early on the morning of May 15, Lee rode down the Valley of the James for a further examination of the river defenses. He had not gone far when across the flats there came the roar of the heaviest guns that had ever echoed over that quiet country. The Federals were attacking Drury's Bluff. A few hours would tell which flag would float at nightfall over the capital. Quickly the ordnance on the cliff took up the challenge. Farther down the river, on either bank, there was the bark of small arms as the southern sharpshooters sought to hold the Federal sailors below decks. For three hours and twenty minutes thunder followed thunder. Then the fire died away and the calm of the countryside settled once again. It was not long before Lee and the anxious city behind him heard what had happened. The redoubtable monitor, the ironclad Galena, and three other ships had steamed up the river almost to the obstructions and had engaged the garrison of the unfinished fortification. The southern gunners had met this attack with a deliberate, accurate fire. The Confederate ship Patrick Henry, above the obstructions, had added the weight of its metal.
Galena, badly mauled, her thick iron plates rent and buckled, had finally quit the fight and, with the other vessels, had dropped down the stream, out of sight. The repulse was as decisive as it was surprising. Would the enemy renew the battle on the river, would he attempt to take Drury's from the land side, or would the next thrust be across the marshes of the sluggish Chickahominy? Lee was not certain, but, so far as his limited authority went, he prepared to make the best resistance he could with the water batteries and on either side of the James. Tactfully he urged Johnston to challenge McClellan's advance before the Federal Army established contact with the fleet on James River. Vigorously he pushed the construction of works on the North Bank, in the expectation that, if Johnston were forced to withdraw closer to Richmond, he would rest his right flank on that stream opposite Drury's Bluff. And all the while he kept looking to Jackson for the move by which, and perhaps by which alone, he believed that Richmond could be saved. Chapter 6. Drive Him Back Toward the Potomac From the time Drury's Bluff was first threatened, about May 12th, until the end of that month, Lee's position was increasingly difficult. Two games of chess, so to speak, were in progress under his eyes. Johnston was playing one, Jackson the other. Over Johnston's game, Lee had no control. Jackson's moves he had been directed to supervise under Davis's verbal orders. Yet Johnston, also, could direct Jackson. Lee had to advise the commander in the valley without knowing when Johnston would look up from his own board and tell Jackson what to do. The closer Jackson came to Richmond, the more certain it was that he would resume his command of Jackson's operations. So far as Lee's own sensibilities were concerned, it made no difference when Johnston again took charge of affairs in the valley. Lee would have been glad at any time to be relieved of responsibility where he lacked commensurate authority. But the strategy of Jackson was complicated and might easily be upset by conflicting orders, whereas, if the most were made of his opportunities, the rapid execution of his plans might change the whole dark situation in Virginia. When Jackson had marched off into the mountains, by roundabout roads, to move against Milroy, west of Staunton, he had left Ewell at Swift Run Gap, in the Blue Ridge. From that point Ewell could watch Banks or move eastward to support Anderson at Fredericksburg in case that officer was assailed. The inactivity of the Federals in the valley and at Fredericksburg puzzled Lee. He could not understand why so large a column as was reported to be just north of Fredericksburg remained quiet for so long a time. He began to doubt if this army of McDowell's was so large as it was supposed to be, and he suspected that McDowell might really be waiting for reinforcements from Banks in the valley. In that case, it was very desirable to keep Banks from sending troops to McDowell, for if McDowell were strengthened, he would certainly march on Richmond. Accordingly, Lee ordered Branch's brigade from North Carolina, where he saw no further evidence of any intention on Burnside's part to move inland toward the railroad that connected Richmond with the South. Branch was dispatched to Gordonsville on May 5 to support Ewell, in the hope that this enlarged force would be strong enough to make a raid on Banks's communications and tie him down in the Shenandoah Valley. Twice after Branch's arrival Lee urged Ewell to undertake this raid if he were not needed to support Jackson or if it should develop that Banks was leaving the valley. Ewell, however, had received a very important piece of news, Banks had ordered three days' rations cooked. Evidently, he was preparing to move. Would it be on Staunton, or down the valley to Winchester, or across the mountains to Fredericksburg or Alexandria? Ewell did not know and, until he could be sure, he decided not to start the raid Lee had authorized. He notified Jackson of Banks' signs of activity and received orders to remain in the valley as long as Banks did or at least until Jackson could return from his expedition against Fremont's army. Jackson, meantime, had been in something of a quandary. Having reached Staunton by a little-used route, he had joined Edward Johnson and, on May 8, had struck Milroy at the village of McDowell and had forced him back with losses. This was the battle the news of which had failed to lift the pervading gloom in Richmond because Jackson had been accounted too rash. The victory, in fact, had been by no means decisive but it had discouraged further federal advances along the Parkersburg Road and it probably had created in the minds of the Federals an exaggerated idea of the Confederate strength in the valley. Jackson's efforts to follow up the enemy had yielded no results and he had been debating a northward movement along a road west of the Shenandoah Mountains in an attempt to get in Banks' rear. On receipt of the news that Banks was cooking three days' rations he resolved his quandary by deciding to return to Ewell via the shortest route. 
As far as Lee knew of the development of these plans, he approved them step by step, leaving all details to Jackson's discretion, but when his adjutant general wrote Jackson to congratulate that officer on the victory at McDowell, he once more reverted to the plan that Lee had put first. General Lee, wrote Taylor, thinks that if you can form a junction with General Ewell with your combined forces, you would be able to drive Banks from the valley. This letter was dated May 14, and it ended the brief period of unhampered direction of Jackson's movements that Lee had enjoyed since Johnston had gone to the peninsula. In two somewhat sharp letters to Lee, Johnston reasserted his right to the direction of operations in northern Virginia, and he now proceeded to exercise it. Johnston's military method was quite different from that of Lee. A general design Johnston could fashion very soundly, but he was careless of details, and, if his larger strategic plans did not work out, he was disposed to extemporize from day to day, retreating if necessary and waiting for some good opportunity to attack. Lee's impulse, one might almost say his military instinct, was to devise a broad general plan or to develop one from circumstance and to watch the details so closely that he did not have to change his basic strategy so often as Johnston did. Lee disliked to direct remote operations because he insisted that he could understand a situation only when he examined the ground, but his method was better suited to such work than Johnston's was. Now that Johnston again assumed control, there was danger that his natural desire to reinforce his own army would lead him to minimize the value of Lee's simple plan to drive Banks from the valley. Johnston's first orders to Ewell and to Jackson were issued on May 13. They provided that if Jackson and Ewell were strong enough, they should attack Banks. Should the latter cross the Blue Ridge, Johnston wrote Ewell, to join General McDowell at Fredericksburg, General Jackson and yourself should move eastward rapidly to join either the army near Fredericksburg, commanded by Brig General J. R. Anderson, or this one. I must be kept informed of your movements and progress, that your instructions may be modified as circumstances change. Branch was to remain with Jackson and Ewell. Lee could have known nothing of these orders, else he would not have urged Jackson, the following day, to fall on Banks with Ewell's support. Two plans of action were thus presented Jackson, both of them contingent. Johnston regarded a joint attack on Banks by Ewell and Jackson as desirable, Lee saw in it the supreme opportunity of the campaign. If Jackson and Ewell could not attack Banks in the valley, Johnston was quite content to have them join Anderson at Fredericksburg or come to Richmond. Lee felt that if the offensive could not be taken in the valley, Jackson and Ewell should strike at Banks as he moved eastward or else assail his line of communication. Only in case of inability to do this was he inclined to send Jackson and Ewell to Fredericksburg. Fundamentally, Lee was determined to keep McDowell from joining McClellan. Johnston had less faith than Lee in the success of any attempt to stop McDowell's march to McClellan. He had previously cherished the hope that this might be done, but he had virtually abandoned it. The whole tone of his correspondence again indicated a belief, never fully expressed, that he must effect a general concentration around Richmond because he could not prevent the junction of McDowell and McClellan. Before either Johnston's conditional orders or Lee's reiterated suggestion of an attack on Banks reached him, Ewell got word that two of his brigades were at Front Royal. This might mean either that Banks was withdrawing for fear he would be outflanked by Jackson, or that he was preparing to leave the valley and join McDowell or McClellan. Under orders from Jackson, Ewell on May 14 put his column in motion after Banks, while Jackson hurried on to overtake Ewell. Advised of these movements by Ewell, Lee did not feel that he should issue orders supplementing those that Johnston had given, but he could not altogether forego advocacy of a plan of which he expected so much. On May 15, he informed Ewell of Jackson's approach and once again reminded him that if upon the junction of yours and General Jackson's forces a blow could be struck at Banks, it would make a happy diversion in our favor in other directions. Writing to Jackson the next day, May 16, he informed him of the general situation and tactfully sought to reconcile Johnston's orders of May 13 with his own suggestion of operations against Banks. He explained that Banks might be planning to join McDowell or to take shipping at Alexandria and reinforce McClellan. Whatever may be Banks's intention, he said, it is very desirable to prevent him from going either to Fredericksburg or the peninsula, and also to destroy the Manassas Gap Road. A successful blow struck at him would delay, if it does not prevent, his moving to either place, and might also lead him to recall the reinforcements sent to Fremont from Winchester.
He went on, but you will not, in any demonstration you may make in that direction, lose sight of the fact that it may become necessary for you to come to the support of General Johnston and hold yourself in readiness to do so if required. On the 17th, the day after Lee sent this letter, Jackson was at Mount Solon, Augusta County, 12 miles southwest of Harrisonburg, and was headed for the Valley Turnpike. Ewell was marching after Banks. That same day fresh reports reached Jackson, Banks had halted his northward movement and was fortifying at Strasburg, 18 miles south of Winchester. Simultaneously, Ewell heard that Shields' command, which had been with Banks, had crossed the Blue Ridge bound for Warrington. This meant, of course, that Banks' strength was reduced. The opportunity of attacking him, as Lee had proposed, seemed to have come. But there was one very serious obstacle. It threatened to upset the whole strategic plan at the very moment when its execution was possible, Johnston's orders to Ewell were that if Banks crossed the Blue Ridge, Ewell must follow him. Ewell was always strict in his construction of orders and he felt that Shields' departure was such a move as Johnston had contemplated. He accordingly considered that he should halt his march down the valley and turn eastward, paralleling Shields. He so advised Jackson, who, in turn, communicated with Johnston telling him what Banks was supposed to be doing at Strasbourg. I have been moving down the valley for the purpose of attacking Banks, Jackson wrote, but the withdrawal of General Ewell's command will prevent my purpose from being executed. I will move on toward Harrisonburg, and if you desire me to cross the Blue Ridge, please let me know by telegraph. The decision Johnston was called upon to make on receipt of this telegram was of the sort that brings out a commander's natural caution or daring, a quality of mind that usually tips the beam one way or the other when arguments seem to be balanced. Lee's whole inclination would have been to take the lesser risks for the sake of the great gain that would follow a defeat of Banks. Johnston's conservatism and his concern for his own army in front of Richmond led him to give contrary orders. If Banks is fortifying near Strasbourg, he told Ewell, the attack would be too hazardous. In such an event, we must leave him in his works. General Jackson can observe him and you can come eastward. If, however, Shields is on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad near the Rapidan, it might be worthwhile for your joint forces to attack him, then for you to move on, while Jackson should keep Banks away from McDowell. We want troops here, none, therefore, must keep away unless employing a greatly superior force of the enemy. In your march, communicate with Brigadier General Anderson, near Fredericksburg, he may require your assistance. My general idea is to gather here all the troops who do not keep away from McClellan's greatly superior forces. Branch's brigade, Ewell's support, in the vicinity of Gordonsville, was directed to move to Johnston's left flank. These orders brought the Valley Campaign to its first crisis. The opportunity of destroying Banks was to be foregone. Jackson was to be left to face Banks in his front and Fremont on his flank or in his rear, as soon as Fremont's army recovered from the minor defeat of Milroy at McDowell. The best that could possibly be gained would be to put shields or to combat. Then Ewell and Anderson probably would be called to Johnston, the line of communications between Richmond and Jackson's army might be cut, and Johnston, plus Ewell and Anderson, might have to face McClellan and McDowell's combined forces. If, on the other hand, Banks were defeated, McDowell's communications might be so threatened that he would not dare advance, and Anderson could join Johnston for an attack on McClellan alone. Johnston could hardly have given more dangerous orders. Lee probably did not know that his cherished plan of an early attack on Banks was threatened with immediate wreck. There is no evidence that the answer of General Johnston to Jackson's telegram was communicated to him. Probably the first he heard of the crisis came in this telegram. Camp near New Market, Virginia. May 20, 1862. General R. E. Lee. I am of opinion that an attempt should be made to defeat Banks, but under instructions just received from General Johnston I do not feel at liberty to make an attack. Please answer by telegraph at once. T. J. Jackson. Major General. Jackson, in other words, had courageously met the crisis. He saw his opportunity lost if Johnston's orders were obeyed. Every impulse, every report of his scouts, every reflection upon the situation convinced him that Lee's strategy was preferable. 
The execution of orders was a part of Jackson's religion not less than of his military code, but in this instance, knowing the greatness of the stakes and the weight of the loss if he failed to attack Banks, he had countermanded the movement of Ewell to the east of the mountains and had appealed to headquarters. It was one of the most important acts of his career and it made possible the movements that were soon to win him a place among the great captains of war. The copious records of the campaign curiously enough do not show precisely what Lee did when he received Jackson's appeal for a revocation of the orders of Johnston. Whether he spurred to Johnston's quarters and prevailed upon that officer to countermand his instructions, or whether he took the question directly to the president, it is impossible to say. The probabilities are that he did not lose the time that a reference of the subject to Johnston inevitably would have involved. The answer, which could only be of one sort, went forward quickly, and at dawn on May 21, Jackson set his column in motion down the valley to join Ewell in an attack on banks, fortifications or no fortifications. Then, for the second time within a month, the curtain of Jackson's military caution was dropped between Richmond and the valley, and days passed before Lee knew what was happening. Chapter 7 – An Anxious Fortnight Ends in a Memorable Ride Jackson was a hundred miles from Richmond when he started in pursuit of Banks, Johnston was only half an hour's ride away. Following the repulse of the Federal gunboats at Drury's Bluff on May 15, Johnston decided to bring the greater part of his army across the Chickahominy River both to give it safety and to cover the land defenses being constructed on the north side of the James opposite the cliff where the garrison of Drury's Bluff had fought so valiantly against the Galena and her sister ships. The Chickahominy's course is roughly parallel to that of the James for many miles, and its upper stretch is only some five miles north of Richmond. At the point where the river is nearest to Richmond, it is crossed by the Virginia Central Railroad, the main line of communication with the Shenandoah Valley. A little farther westward lies the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad. As it was necessary to guard these railways, Johnston put part of one division north of the Chickahominy. The right flank of his main force he gradually drew in until on May 22 it was across the Charles City Road, about five miles from the corporate limits of Richmond. Thence his line ran generally northward to the vicinity of the Chickahominy. His left was close to the Fairfield Racecourse, almost within the northeastern suburbs of the city, but his outposts were north of the Chickahominy as far as Mechanicsville. McClellan, advancing cautiously, was known to have two corps of his army at Cold Harbor, about eight miles northeast of Richmond and was believed to be preparing to extend his right flank to form a ready junction with McDowell whenever that officer moved southward from Fredericksburg. The rest of McClellan's army, on the 22d, was crossing the Chickahominy at Bottoms Bridge, 15 miles east of Richmond, and was advancing up the Williamsburg Road. If Johnston had to withdraw his left, he would expose the railroads, but he would find good cover for his troops on the high hills overlooking the Chickahominy on the side nearest Richmond. If he retired his right, however, it would have had to move across a flat country and could find no cover except scattered woods and an incomplete line of earthworks that had been thrown up, chiefly after Lee's return from Savannah. It was a line so dangerously close to Richmond that the sound of a heavy action would almost certainly be heard in President Davis's office. Should the Confederate line break in a rout, two hours' pursuit would bring the Federals into the streets of Richmond. Close as Johnston was to Richmond, he had shown no intention of giving battle and had not informed the President when he intended doing so. Soon after he crossed the Chickahominy, Davis and Lee rode out to his headquarters in order that the President might be apprised of the situation. The General was absent at the time, visiting his troops, but he returned and spent the evening with his guests. It was not a satisfactory conference. Johnston was reticent and seemed to have no definite plan, though the three talked together until too late for the president to return that night. The next morning, as Davis and Lee rode back toward Richmond, the president spoke of their discussion. Loth as Lee was to criticize a fellow soldier, he was compelled to confess that he had been able to draw only one inference from Johnston's remarks, Johnston apparently planned to improve his position as best he could and would wait to attack the enemy at some favorable opportunity. Subsequently, Lee asked Johnston to come to Richmond to review the situation with the president, but Johnston did not answer. Three days later, on May 21, Lee again wrote to ask a report in the name of Mr. Davis and renewed his suggestion that Johnston communicate in person with the chief executive. Now, on the 22d, the president and Lee rode out to Mechanicsville, where they found a disheartening lack of organization.
My conclusion, Davis wrote Johnston, after this ride, was, that if, as reported to be probable, General Franklin, with a division, was in that vicinity he might easily have advanced over the turnpike toward if not to Richmond. It was difficult for Davis and doubly difficult for Lee to assist in a defense concerning which the field commander did not see fit to advise them. At length, probably on May 24, General Johnston came into Richmond and doubtless had an interview with Mr. Davis, but apparently he did not explain his plan. The same day the enemy occupied Mechanicsville, only five miles from Richmond, and an admirable position from which to form a junction with McDowell when the latter came down from the north. There was nothing to stop him from doing so. For Johnston had ordered Anderson back from the line of the Rappahannock. At that very time, also, Johnston was preparing to abandon the Virginia Central Railroad west of Hanover Junction. Branch's brigade from Gordonsville had already come down and was stationed at Hanover Courthouse in an exposed position. Everything indicated the loss of Northern Virginia and the early junction of the two federal forces immediately in front of Richmond with a strength not much below 150,000. To oppose them, Johnston would not have more than 72,000 after Anderson's troops from the Rappahannock had formally united with him. Only one of three things could save Richmond, a miracle, a successful attack by Johnston on McClellan before McDowell could arrive, or the failure of McDowell to advance. Impatient at Johnston's failure to make any movement or to confide his plan, despite their recent interview, Davis expressed to Lee his deep dissatisfaction. The president's concern was so manifest, and the possible effects of a continued misunderstanding were so serious that Lee once more volunteered to act as a peacemaker. General Johnston, he said to Davis, should of course advise you of what he expects or proposes to do. Let me go and see him and defer this discussion until I return. Riding out to Johnston's headquarters, Lee must have had a more satisfactory interview with Johnston than on his previous visit in the company of the president, for he brought back news that Johnston intended on the 29th to attack that part of the Federal Army north of the Chickahominy. At last, the prospect of an offensive against McClellan. And with it the news of an event that might add vastly to its success. Rumor had been bringing reports of battles in the valley, behind the screen of Jackson's secret maneuvers, but there had been nothing definite and nothing official. Now, on the 26th, came a messenger with dispatches from Jackson. The very first word of the letter to the adjutant general was an assurance of a victory, for the paper was dated at Winchester, which had been 18 miles behind Banks's lines at last reports. General S. Cooper during the last three days God has blessed our arms with brilliant success. On Friday, 23d, the Federals at Front Royal were routed, and one section of artillery, in addition to many prisoners, captured. On Saturday Banks's main column, while retreating from Strasbourg to Winchester, was pierced, the rear part retreating towards Strasbourg. On Sunday, the other part was routed at this place. At last accounts Brig General George H. Stewart was pursuing with cavalry and artillery and capturing the fugitives. A large amount of medical, ordnance, and other stores have fallen into our hands. T. J. Jackson Major General, Commanding Faith in the eccentric Jackson had been vindicated. The often urged, much debated attack on banks had been delivered. Private messages that followed Jackson's telegram described a rout, indeed, with Banks's scattered troops driven back to the Potomac. Northern papers, smuggled across the lines, made no attempt to conceal the magnitude of the defeat. What would be the effect? On the answer might hang the outcome of the battle that Johnston was preparing in front of Richmond. Whatever movement you make against Banks, Lee had written Jackson on May 16, do it speedily, and if successful drive him back toward the Potomac and create the impression, as far as practicable, that you design threatening that line. Jackson had executed the first part of this plan and could be counted on to spread the fear of a farther advance. His returning messenger carried Lee's suggestion that Jackson demonstrate with vigor. Would McDowell ignore that warning? Would Johnston's plan to strike on the 29th be thwarted by a southward advance of the Federals? If so, Jackson's movement might simply have eliminated Banks temporarily as a factor in the situation. But if the threat on the Potomac halted or delayed McDowell's advance until Johnston could drive against McClellan, then a victory at Richmond might break up the whole stupendous combination against the capital.
so much depended on Johnston's proposed offensive that every nerve of the Confederacy was strained to reinforce him. The War Department and General Lee labored feverishly to place Huger in supporting distance of Johnston to expedite the movement of two regiments under General Ripley, who had been ordered from Charleston on May 23, and to hurry northward units of Holmes's force in North Carolina that Lee now determined to bring to Richmond at the risk of a possible advance by Burnside. Everywhere, on the morning of May 27, the question was the same, what news of McDowell? Had he started across the Rappahannock? He had four days' march ahead of him and that, of course, would prevent him from arriving in front of Richmond before Johnston attacked McClellan on the 29th. At the same time, the line of McDowell's advance would lie in rear of Johnston's assaulting columns. Consequently, if McDowell were close at hand by the day set for the battle, the risk to the numerically inferior Confederate force would be too great for it to assume the offensive. It was raining hard at Richmond, and that was encouraging. A heavy downfall north of the city would inevitably slow up McDowell's advance. Before noon, the worst possible news reached Johnston's headquarters in a telegram from General Anderson, whose force was strung out on a road leading from Hanover Junction to Richmond. Anderson's vedettes, covering his rear, reported that McDowell had started to march on Richmond. The main federal column was already six miles south of Fredericksburg and the advance guard was at Guineas, less than 40 miles from Richmond. Had Lee been mistaken in his strategy? Had Jackson's demonstration been in vain? Later in the day, this grim question seemed to be answered by what the Confederates regarded as an ominous happening. A strong federal force struck Branch's brigade at Hanover Courthouse during the afternoon and forced it back. The Southern strategists reasoned that McClellan was extending his right flank to meet McDowell. With Hanover Courthouse in federal hands, the gap between McDowell's advanced guard and McClellan's right was reduced to less than 25 miles. Cavalry contact might readily be established the next day, May 28. The outlook seemed almost hopeless. Thick clouds obscured the sky on the morning of the 28th. The rain continued to pour down. The traditional long spell in May had seen a succession of heavy storms, broken only by a day or two of sunshine. The worst of it was now brewing. The Chickahominy, whose sluggish waters ran through a wide, low valley, was higher than it had been in twenty years. In Richmond, curiously enough, panic had died away. Not knowing the weakness of the reinforcements that had been brought up, the people believed the army ample for the defense of the city. Quietly they went about the work of cleaning and preparing the hospitals for the army of wounded they expected after the battle that everyone knew the Confederates would have to fight within a day or two. Even an order for the removal of the government archives created no new apprehension. Lee spent the morning in final efforts to bring up the troops hurrying northward from the Carolinas. Johnston was satisfied that McDowell was approaching. There seemed nothing to do except to prepare for the inevitable and either to strike McClellan, as planned, in the desperate hope of defeating him decisively before McDowell could come up, or else to draw in the lines for a stubborn defense against overpowering odds. Huger, Holmes, and Ripley might bring up the total force to 80,000, perhaps to 85,000, but what could they do against an estimated 150,000 Federals with superior artillery? Night brought no news to Richmond, though couriers were hurrying about on the lines and long conferences were being held. On the morning of the 29th, the day of the promised Confederate attack, nervous thousands listened and strained their ears, but heard no sound of battle. Did contrary wind and a heavy atmosphere drown the roar of the guns, or had there been some hitch, some unexplained change of plans, when a day's delay in attacking McClellan might mean ruin? Davis hurried through his office work and took the road to Mechanicsville. Lee could not remain behind. To sit in the office, to listen and hear nothing, to wait and know nothing, to be an advisor when he yearned to be a participant, was a more terrific ordeal than even he could endure. It would be worse, by far, than his experience on the 21st of the previous July when Johnston and Beauregard had been fighting at Manassas and President Davis had hastened away on a special train, leaving him there in Richmond in suspense and regret. He must do something. Quickly, he ordered his horse and went out, probably to Johnston's headquarters. He found no battle in progress, but he heard news that meant as much as victory, news that would have thrown an army on its knees in the Middle Ages with a cry of miracle, miracle.
Yun Jeb Stewart had put a cavalry outpost close to McDowell on the previous day, and late in the night he had reported that McDowell, hurrying southward to join McClellan, had halted his columns in the road on the 28th and then had turned them around and had marched back to Fredericksburg. It seemed incredible, but Stewart vouched for it. There might be speculation as to the reasons for this astounding deliverance, but what was more reasonable than to suppose that the victory at Winchester, the rout of Banks, and Jackson's intelligent discharge of his orders to threaten the line of the Potomac had led the Washington government to order McDowell closer to Washington? Lee had believed that a successful attack on Banks would relieve pressure on Fredericksburg, and that had been the chief reason he had so often urged Jackson forward amid a thousand difficulties. And now the relief had come when it might be the salvation of the Confederacy. It was not Lee's nature to exult or to count personal performance, least of all in comparison with that of other men, but as he stood, an observer in the midst of actors, he could have reflected that Johnston might fight the battle, but that he had made the victory possible with the stout aid of Jackson. The great news that McDowell was marching away from Richmond, instead of toward it, had led G.W. Smith to argue on the night of the 28th to 29th for a change of plan, on the ground that the federal flank north of the Chickahominy rested on a very strong natural barrier, Beaver Dam Creek, which it was not desirable to attempt to storm if there was no immediate necessity of striking McClellan in the expectation that he was about to be reinforced by McDowell. The question had been argued at length and a decision had been reached to call off the battle and to regroup the forces for an attack south of the river. That was why Lee found no action underway. Lee rode back to the city that afternoon but he had been in the tense atmosphere of approaching conflict and he could no longer restrain himself. He must have an active part in the defense of Virginia, no matter what his role. Rather the command of a brigade, a regiment, even service as a voluntary aide on Johnston's staff, without authority, than in action behind office walls. So, on the morning of May 30th, though entirely uninformed as to when Johnston proposed to attack on the south side of the Chickahominy, he sent Colonel A. L. Long, his military secretary, out to Johnston's headquarters with a personal message. He had no desire, he bade Long tell the general, of interfering with his command, but he would be glad to serve in the field in any capacity during the coming action. While waiting for an answer, restlessness overcame him. There had been some confusion whether McClellan's flank extended to the Virginia Central Railroad north of Richmond. Unable to perform any better service, Lee determined to ride out Brook Road and reconnoiter. Accompanied by a few members of his staff, he went to the crossing of the Telegraph Road over the Chickahominy, talked with a few officers he met there, and satisfied himself that the Federals had moved their advance guard eastward, back from the railroad. Then he trotted homeward, with what thoughts, one wonders. The war had been on for thirteen months, and during all that time he had not fought a battle for his country. Was he doomed to remain always a headquarters general? Had his long preparation brought him only to this? Back in Richmond, in the anxious twilight, he dispatched a report to Johnston of what he had found. Presently Long came in, bringing a polite, indefinite answer to his message, Johnston would be happy to have him ride out to the field, and, meantime, would Lee send him all the reinforcements he could collect? Johnston did not tell Long, nor did Long learn from any other source, when the battle for Richmond would open. Still uncertainty, still suspense. That evening there was thunder in the heavens and the heaviest storm that had been visited on the territory around Richmond during the whole of the drenching spring, but no sound of conflict came from the east or the northeast. It was simply another dark, anxious night, with nothing to indicate that on the morrow a bloody milestone was to be set in the career of the anxious soldier who doubtless ended the day on his knees in his gloomy room at the Spotswood Hotel. Saturday morning, May 31st, dull and cloudy, found Lee still restless. No commanding duties held him at his office. Huger's troops were across James River, in good position to be used by Johnston when and where they were needed. Holmes had been ordered to Richmond. Ripley had arrived from South Carolina. All the troops from in front of Fredericksburg had joined Johnston. Chances had been taken that the minor fronts might be penetrated. To Loring, who was calling for troops in western Virginia, word was sent that no reinforcements were available and that he must make the best defense in his power. The concentration of every unit that could be brought to Richmond in time for the battle had either been affected or was so nearly completed that the rest was routine. 
A last-minute call was sent Pemberton in South Carolina for two regiments to replace some of the men soon to fall. This final bit of business transacted, an irresistible desire to see what was happening on the front of the opposing armies led Lee to take horse and ride out with some of his lieutenants to Johnston's headquarters. These had been moved from the Harrison House on the Williamsburg Road, near the junction of the Darby Town Road, and had been established about three miles from the city on the Nine Mile Road, a thoroughfare that led to the enemy's main position east of Richmond and south of the Chickahominy. Learning that Johnston had gone forward, Lee went on to the point where the new bridge road turned off to the left from the Nine Mile Road. Magruder's headquarters were there, and his men were in line of battle across the road ahead. Here, in a house on the right, slightly off the highway, Lee found General Johnston. There was a tenseness in the air. Officers were coming and going. Johnston was preoccupied. A general movement evidently was afoot. That obvious fact Johnston must have announced to Lee. He may have added that he was disposing his troops anew for an attack on the Federals supposed to be around Seven Pines and Fair Oaks, two miles ahead, but he did not explain his plan in detail or tell Lee when the battle was to open. Noon passed. Presently, from the southeast, came the intermittent mutter of heavy guns and, very faintly, after three o'clock, a sound that Lee's ear took to be the sound of musketry. But, no, Johnston explained, it could only be an artillery duel. He did not elaborate and Lee did not argue. Ere long, orders reached the troops waiting at the forks of the road, the word of command was passed, and Whiting's men hurried down the road that led toward the enemy. And still, as if in subdued accompaniment to the feet of the soldiers, Lee heard that strange, indefinite sound from the south. Now a familiar mounted figure turned into the lane from the road. It was the President. A moment later, either by chance or with intent to avoid an embarrassing meeting, Johnston rode away across the field, in the direction of Whiting's march. Lee went out to meet Mr. Davis. The president's first question was what the musketry fire meant. Had he heard it? Lee asked. Assuredly, Davis answered, what was on? Lee explained that he had thought it was musketry, but had been assured by Johnston that only artillery was in action. Together, the two walked to the rear of the house and listened. There was now no mistaking the sound, faint though it was. Either a heavy skirmish or a battle was in progress somewhere down the way where the Nine Mile Road turned to Fair Oaks Station on the Richmond and York River Railroad, above the homely settlement of Seven Pines. Davis, always a soldier at heart, could never resist the impulse to ride to the sound of firing, and with a few words he returned to his horse and started forward. Equally anxious, Lee rode with him. It was now late afternoon, with every promise of an early twilight in that wooded country. If a battle was being fought, night would soon end it, one way or another. They went down the road for nearly a mile, with a thick wood on their right and open ground on their left. Then, beyond a lane leading off toward the Chickahominy, they found a heavy tangle of timber on their left also. Close by was a field on which a crop of oats was growing. The troops they had followed up the road, Whiting's and Pettigrew's brigades, had left the road near this point and had deployed on the left, driving back the federal pickets to an unseen line that was assumed to run almost perpendicular to the railroad. Before they knew it, Lee and Davis were under a hot fire, in a scene of the greatest confusion. To their left, hidden Federal batteries, almost in rear of the Confederate forces farther down the road, were pouring a regular and well-paced fire into charging ranks that floundered over fallen logs and through the bushes, vainly seeking the Federal infantry. On the right, beyond a belt of woods, another column was engaged. The clouds hung low, the smoke was everywhere. Already the wounded were limping to the rear, the line on the left was making little or no progress. Johnston was somewhere down the road in the thickest of the fire, Smith, who commanded that wing of the army, had also gone ahead, the Secretary of War, other cabinet officers, and a few members of Congress were galloping about. Nobody seemed to know anything except that the enemy was strong and resisting hotly, and that, away on the right, an even more desperate action was in progress. It was apparent that unless the federal flank on the left of the Nine Mile Road was turned and the batteries in that locality silenced, Whiting's troops would sustain a bloody repulse. 
Lee was merely an observer and could not act, even in such an emergency, but Davis made a hurried reconnaissance and sent off one messenger and then another to find General Magruder and to direct him to throw a Confederate brigade beyond the Federal right, up a path in the woods. Magruder, like the others, was in the battle. Search for him was vain. Davis was starting in person to look for him when a returning courier reported that he had located General Richard Griffith, one of Magruder's brigadiers, and had delivered the message to him. It was beginning to get dark. From the right, through the woods and over a little field, the left of Hood's Texas Brigade of Smith's division was coming forward to support the troops beyond the Nine Mile Road. Griffith's men were being assembled for the advance on the left. But it was too late. Before the flanking column could start, Whiting's troops began to stream back from the thickets. They had not been able to reach the Federal line in the woods. Dusk made it almost impossible to distinguish blue coat from gray. Further effort would be a waste of life. Davis suspended Griffith's movement. The Federal fire continued. The troops waited to see if it would be followed by a counterattack. Presently up rode Postmaster General Reagan, a Texan, who had come to the battlefield to cheer Hood's men in action. He had been farther to the southward and had found General Johnston in great danger, in a most exposed position. Davis, he instantly observed, was taking like chances needlessly. He protested warmly against the President's remaining where a bullet might strike him down at any minute. Davis refused to leave and now a courier passed by from the left, with the news that General Wade Hampton had been shot. On his heels rode another mounted messenger who told them, they gasped as they heard it, that General Johnston had been wounded, some thought fatally. Darkness, a joint battle, crowded confusion, a multitude of wounded and the army left without the one man who knew all the dispositions, was the story of Shiloh to be repeated, when a mortal injury to another Johnston had lost the South a great victory, as all Southerners believed? Before Lee and Davis had time to think of the possible effects of this loss, up the road came litter-bearers bringing General Johnston, conscious, but in so much pain from two serious wounds that he had not been able to stand the jostling of the ambulance in which he had first been placed. Gone on the instant was the coolness that Davis had felt. With warm, friendly words he expressed his deep regret and his hope that Johnston would soon be able to take the field again. Lee, of course, cherishing no malice for Johnston's petulance and secretiveness, saw only the friend of his youth, the companion of happier days, stricken and helpless, and his warm affection went out to him. It was a desperate hour, and it promised a desperate tomorrow. Fortunately, the enemy had suffered heavily and was quite content to leave the issue as it was. No countercharge was pressed through the woods where the dead lay among the blood-soaked logs, under the shattered trees and in the underbrush that was reddened as if with the touch of autumn. The broken regiments reformed beyond and across the road and prepared to sleep on their arms, in exhaustion so complete that even the groans of the wounded and the ghostly creaking of the ambulances would not awaken them. And now General Smith had come up. From him, for the first time, Davis and Lee learned as much as he knew of the battle they had witnessed but had not understood. Johnston, they were told, had expected by a sudden attack to overwhelm that part of McClellan's army on the south side of the Chickahominy at a time when he believed the rise in the waters of that river would prevent the dispatch of federal reinforcements from the ample divisions north of that whimsical stream. D. H. Hill, with four brigades, was to have advanced down the Williamsburg Road and was to have opened the battle, with Huger on the Charles City Road to turn the left of the enemy. Smith had understood that Longstreet was to have moved down the Nine Mile Road to form on Hill's left, but, he explained, in some manner unknown to him, Longstreet had gone over to the Williamsburg Road and had attacked there. Smith's own command, General Johnston had told him, was to occupy the extreme Confederate left, to serve as a support for Longstreet, if needed, and to watch against a possible movement by the Unionists from across the Chickahominy. For reasons that Smith did not know, the opening of the action had been long delayed. Then heavy fighting had broken out on the right and Longstreet had called for help, Smith said, federal troops had unexpectedly arrived from the north of the Chickahominy and the greater part of Smith's troops, under Whiting, had been brought up and thrown into action. Whiting, Smith concluded, had been heavily engaged. Did Davis know anything of the battle on the right? Had he received any word from Longstreet later than a message sent to Johnston at four o'clock?
Davis had no information, and, as Smith was the senior major general on the field, the president asked him what his plans were. Smith, who was manifestly under heavy nervous strain, naturally could not answer on such short notice. He could make no decision, he said, until he could ascertain how the battle had gone on the front of D. H. Hill and Longstreet, from neither of whom he had heard. It might be necessary, he said, to withdraw closer to Richmond and form a new line. He might, on the other hand, be able to hold his ground. Davis suggested that if he remained where he was, the Federals might fall back during the night and thereby give the Confederates the moral effect of a victory. Smith could only reply that he would not retire unless compelled to do so. If the outcome of the action on the right had not been more serious than on his own part of the line, he saw no reason for retreating. There was no more to be said. After a few minutes, Davis bade farewell to Smith and turned his horse's head back up the nine-mile road toward Richmond. Lee went with him. Along the deeply trampled highway, past the woods where the reserves were sleeping, and on by the endless line of ambulances, bound the same way as themselves, the two rode in darkness. They must have talked, of course, of the frightfully mismanaged battle they had witnessed, and the forthright Davis must have commented on Smith's manifest confusion, on the lack of staff work, and on the strange misunderstanding of Longstreet's route. Then, perhaps, the two riders lapsed into silence, each pondering his duty in the confused situation that existed. At length, Davis uttered the few and simple words that were to change the whole course of the war in Virginia. General Lee, he said, in effect, I shall assign you to the command of this army. Make your preparations as soon as you reach your quarters. I shall send you the order when we get to Richmond. Chapter 8, TTD Larmy, that is, Head of the Army. The battle probably would be renewed with the dawn. That meant infinitely more to Lee than personal advancement or opportunity. He could not attempt to direct the fighting immediately, for that would be as dangerous to the army as it would be unfair to Smith. What, then, could he do to help Smith? Over that question Lee wrestled after he returned to Richmond. Before five o'clock on the morning of the first, a courier was knocking at his door with a dispatch from Smith, telling of his dispositions and asking for more troops and additional engineers. In his own hand, Lee answered at once, answered with a consideration for Smith's feelings that reflected not a pose but an honest wish for the success of a comrade in arms. Richmond, June 1, 1862. 5 a.m. General. Your letter of this morning just arrived. Ripley will be ordered and such forces from General Holmes as can be got up will be sent. Your movements are judicious and determination to strike the enemy right. Try and ascertain his position and how he can best be hit. I will send such engineers as I can raise. But with Stevens, Whiting, Alexander, etc., what can I give you like them? You are right in calling upon me for what you want. I wish I could do more. It will be a glorious thing if you can gain a complete victory. Our success on the whole yesterday was good, but not complete. Truly. R. E. Lee, General. He addressed it to G. N. L. G. W. Smith, Comge, Army of N. Virginia and sent it off. Then he set himself to redeeming the promise of his letter. At this he was laboring when he received a brief, formal communication from the President. Davis explained that the wounding of Johnston renders it necessary to interfere temporarily with the duties to which you were assigned in connection with the general service, but only so far as to make you available for command in the field of a particular army, which was a diplomatic way of serving notice to all and sundry that there was no occasion to renew the agitation for the appointment of a commanding general. Other dispatches came, every hour brought new calls, time had to be found to draft an address for publication to the army when Lee took command, preparations had to be made to move the office. It was about 1 p.m., June 1, 1862, an historic hour in the military history of the United States, when Lee was able to start with his staff for the battlefield. He was now aged 55 and had been in the service of the Confederacy more than 13 months, without having participated in a single general engagement. Only once, and then but the day previously, had he been under close fire since, in September, 1847, the guns of Chapultepec had been silenced.
he was as old as Haig was when he succeeded Sir John French, three years older than Ludendorff when that officer became quartermaster general, eight years younger than Joffrey at the Marne, and thirteen years the junior of Hindenburg in 1914 and in Foch in 1918. Wellington, at 37, had seven years in which to fix the fame he had won in Spain, to Marlborough, after he was 52, a decade of campaigning as supreme commander remained, Napoleon, a general in Italy at 27, was destined to have 19 years before Waterloo. For Lee, Appomattox was distant only 34 months. In what spirit did Lee approach the sprawling, weary lines of the army he was henceforth to lead? He did not confide his thoughts to his staff officers as they trotted along, but his feelings probably were those he put on paper the next day in a letter to his daughter-in-law. I wish, said he, that, Johnston's, mantle had fallen upon an abler man, or that I were able to drive our enemies back to their homes. I have no ambition and no desire but the attainment of this object, and therefore only wish for its accomplishment by him that can do it most speedily and thoroughly. It was the profession of a simple soul, and such a soul was Lee's. Riding out the Nine Mile Road, Lee found President Davis and General Smith at the Hughes House, about a mile closer to Richmond than the headquarters occupied the previous day. The battle around Seven Pines had been renewed during the morning, as Lee had expected, but Smith had not been successful in winning a victory. Instead, the action at that hour seemed to be dying indecisively away. Davis had already notified Smith that Lee was to supersede him, so explanations were unnecessary, and an immediate conference could be held to acquaint Lee with the exact dispositions. At its conclusion Lee and Smith went over to the headquarters of General Longstreet on the Williamsburg Road. They found that Longstreet's troops had broken off the battle, but that their commander was anxious to renew it, confident of victory. The forces on the flanks, however, were not in hand for immediate cooperation, so Lee ordered the whole army back to the lines it had occupied before the battle of the previous day. Thereupon Lee returned to the Nine Mile Road, where he opened headquarters in a house belonging to Mrs. Mary C. Dabbs, widow of Josiah Dabbs, a property about a mile and a half from the outskirts of the city. One of his first acts was to issue as an order the address he had prepared before leaving Richmond. It is worth quoting in full, for two reasons. It was the first of a series that was to range every chord of resolution, triumph, and exhortation before the solemn finale was sounded at Appomattox. In the second place, this order gave the army the name it was to make famous. Lee, and Lee alone, had already styled it the Army of Northern Virginia in various references to it, but never before had it been so addressed in its own orders. It was by happy chance and not through deliberate design that Lee christened the army the very day he assumed command. Special Orders Number 22 Headquarters Richmond, Virginia, June 1, 1862 I, in pursuance of the orders of the President, General R. E. Lee assumes command of the armies of Eastern Virginia and North Carolina. The unfortunate casualty that has deprived the army in front of Richmond of the valuable services of its able general is not more deeply deplored by any member of his command than by its present commander. He hopes his absence will be but temporary, and while he will endeavor to the best of his ability to perform his duties, he feels he will be totally inadequate to the task unless he shall receive the cordial support of every officer and man. The presence of the enemy in front of the capital, the great interests involved, and the existence of all that is dear to us appeal in terms too strong to be unheard, and he feels assured that every man has resolved to maintain the ancient fame of the Army of Northern Virginia and the reputation of its general and to conquer or die in the approaching contest. 2. Commanders of divisions and brigades will take every precaution and use every means in their power to have their commands in readiness at all times for immediate action. They will be careful to preserve their men as much as possible, that they may be fresh when called upon for active service. All surplus baggage, broken down wagons, horses, and mules, and everything that may embarrass the prompt and speedy movement of the army will be turned into depot. Only sufficient transportation will be retained for carrying the necessary cooking utensils and such tents or tent flies as are indispensable to the comfort and protection of the troops. By order of General Lee. W. H. Taylor. Assistant Adjutant General. The troops politely cheered when this order was read to them, but no enthusiasm attended the announcement of the selection of Lee as commander of the army.
the newspapers had been requested to omit all reference to the wounding of Johnston and consequently most of them had no comment on the choice of his successor. The single violation in Richmond of this voluntary censorship was a mild expression of hope by the hostile Richmond examiner that Lee would prove himself a competent successor to General Johnston and complete his great undertaking. This tepid commendation was coupled with an encomium on Johnston, time may yet produce another, but no living man in America is yet ascertained to possess a military character so profound or a decision of character so remarkable. A few loyal admirers expressed the belief that the change of commanders would bring victory. Up in the valley, the inimitable Ewell, Jackson's right-hand man, announced that he would not be scared to fight under Lee. Most of Johnston's lieutenants, taking their cue from him, had been very critical of the Richmond government and they resented the selection of a staff officer to lead them. There were misgivings as to Lee's power and skill for field service and fears that he would not be aggressive. Smith felt that he should be left to direct operations, the best that Longstreet could say for the change was that it afforded a happy relief from the halting policy of the unhappy Smith. Aside from Davis, the only man of station who seemed to realize what Lee might accomplish in the field was Johnston himself. His petulance vanished with a few days' rest and ere long he saw clearly how the friction between him and the administration had endangered the defense of Richmond. When told by a friend that his wounding was a calamity to the South, Johnston manfully answered, No, sir. The shot that struck me down is the very best that has been fired for the Southern cause yet. For I possess in no degree the confidence of our government, and now they have in my place one who does possess it, and who can accomplish what I never could have done, the concentration of our armies for the defensive of the capital of the Confederacy. Neither the army nor the swelling anti-Davis cabal in Richmond knew that this was the opinion of Johnston when his nerves were restored and his shoulders eased of responsibility. In some quarters, disparagement, sarcasm and ridicule were the lot of Lee. The new commander wasted no time in answering or in mollifying critics but bent himself to the task of saving Richmond. Circumstance gave him the necessary time. McClellan had been shaken by the impetuous attacks at Seven Pines, and though his casualties were less by 1103 than the Confederates had sustained, his cautious nature prompted him to delay further operations until reinforcements made good his casualties. Lee had no information of this, of course, nor was he aware that most of the eleven bridges that McClellan had been constructing across the Chickahominy had been washed away, but he could judge the effects of the weather on the roads McClellan would be compelled to use. And that weather was of the worst. The day Lee took command the battleground was so heavy that President Davis's mount had been mired knee-deep. There was rain on June 3, a heavy storm during the night of June 3-4, a downfall on the 4th, no sunshine on the 5th, showers during the night of the 5th to 6th, and a near deluge on the morning of the 6th. The Chickahominy bottom was covered with three or four feet of water, the whole face of the country was a bog, General Burnside, visiting there, took four and one half hours to go nine miles on horseback. You have seen nothing like the roads on Chickahominy bottom, Lee told Davis on the 5th. Behind the temporary barrier of these mud courses, Lee reasoned fast. His first concern, of course, was a position of immediate security for the army. Should it remain where it was, or should it fall back closer to Richmond? After a conference with Longstreet, Lee decided to hold the ground on which the troops then rested, as he believed this would keep McClellan's army astride the Chickahominy. This settled, Lee's next task, of course, was to prevent the capture of Richmond. On this, he was determined. The sentiments he had expressed at the cabinet meeting, about the time of the attack on Drury's Bluff, were stronger now that he had the responsibility of command. He told one politician that if he had to evacuate Richmond, he would fall back to the mountains, and, he added, if my soldiers will stand by me, I will fight those people for years to come. It was manifest, however, that Richmond could not be held indefinitely against McClellan's larger army, possessed as the Federals were of ample artillery of superior range. The way to save the capital was to drive McClellan off, before his army was overwhelming or his guns close enough to shell the city. To attack McClellan, Richmond must be so protected by earthworks that it could be defended by a small force while the rest of the army attacked. Preparation of works would take time, and the outcome of an offensive was of course doubtful. Consequently, it was necessary to keep reinforcements from McClellan and, at the same time, to make it difficult for him to bring up heavy ordnance with which to open parallels.
This was Lee's initial analysis of his military problem, an analysis quickly completed and immediately applied. His first move was to provide for the construction of the earthworks. I desire you, he wrote his chief engineer, Major W. H. Stevens, on June 3, to make an examination of the country in the vicinity of the line which our army now occupies, with a view of ascertaining the best position in which we may fight a battle or resist the advance of the enemy. The commanding points on the line I desire to be prepared for occupation by our field guns and the whole line strengthened by such artificial defenses as time may permit. My object is to make use of every means in our power to strengthen ourselves and to enable us to fight the enemy to the best advantage. It is not intended to construct a continuous line of defense or to erect extensive works. Having selected the line and put the works in progress of construction, I desire you to resume the examination and see what other positions can be taken near Richmond in case of necessity. I have to request that you will push forward the work with the utmost diligence. The next day he organized a pioneer corps of 300 men from each division and placed them under Stevens's command to work on the entrenchments. He had little faith in military labor by slaves, though later he had to employ it. So much for the first steps. With good speed and good fortune, Richmond would be safe enough, in two or three weeks, for him to make a thrust at his adversary. But how was he to keep the industrious McClellan from pounding his way by regular approaches within striking distance of Richmond? McClellan, he told Mr. Davis, will make this a battle of posts. He will take position from position under cover of his heavy guns and we cannot get at him without storming his works, which with our new troops is extremely hazardous. The roads, Lee reasoned, were so heavy that McClellan could not haul siege guns over them. He must use the Richmond and York River Railway. If, therefore, some method could be devised to keep the Federals from employing the railroad for this purpose, a bombardment might be avoided until Lee was ready for an offensive. It was a new problem in war. Lee solved it by proposing to mount and armor a heavy gun upon a railroad truck which could be run down the Richmond and York River line, outranging the Federal ordinance on the swampy ground. This was the birth of railway ordinance. Simultaneously, he directed an immediate reorganization of the Confederate artillery to render it more mobile and more efficient. Cover was being prepared for an offensive. An untried weapon for halting the movement of the Federal heavy artillery was to be fashioned. How, next, was he to guard against the possibility that McDowell would move southward again, reinforce McClellan, and envelop Richmond with a force against which an offensive would be merely a waste of life? Jackson's victory at Winchester had been an immense relief, of great advantage as Lee conservatively put it, but the demonstration on the Potomac had been short-lived. Fremont from the west and Shields from the east had threatened the rear of the Army of the Valley and had forced Jackson to withdraw. Only his daring and his hard marching had enabled his 16,000 men to elude the Federals' 60,000 and more. Once out of the Federal pincers, Jackson had immediately projected a new thrust at the enemy. He had sent to Lee a Confederate congressman, a R. Bottler, with a statement of his situation. Placed where he was, Jackson had bidden Bottler to tell Lee he believed he could strike successfully at Shields, but, he went on, if Lee could send him enough reinforcements to raise his army to 40,000 men, he could invade the North. In talking with Bottler, about June 3rd or 4, Lee did not see how he could do more than replace Jackson's losses, which he was already preparing to make good, and he perhaps told Bottler that before he could give Jackson 40,000 reinforcements, Jackson would have to unite with him and drive McClellan from in front of Richmond, a possibility which, on June 2nd, he had discussed with Davis. With this message, Bottler returned to the valley. Pondering the question, however, Lee saw the immense possibilities of an offensive in the North and he decided to make an effort to comply with Jackson's request. After much reflection, he wrote the President on June 5th, I think if it was possible to reinforce Jackson strongly, it would change the character of the war. This can only be done by the troops in Georgia, S.C., N.N.C. Jackson could in that event cross Maryland into Penn. It would call all the enemy from our southern coast and liberate those states. If these states will give up their troops, I think it can be done. In other words, if the South Atlantic states would take the risks, Jackson could assume the offensive and undertake an invasion of the North.
that would lead to the immediate evacuation of the Georgia and Carolina coast and, at the same time, would prevent the reinforcement of McClellan on any large scale. The danger that would result from stripping these states of their defenders was not excessive, for there was reason to believe the Union forces had been reduced along the coast. Besides, the heat and the mosquitoes had settled over the swamps and were as effective a barrier to a federal advance as would have been a bristling, bayonet line, crowded with troops. The situation had changed much, in this respect, since Lee had left Savannah, had changed for the better, indeed, since he had opposed the withdrawal of forces from that front at the time of the Council of War preceding Johnston's move to the peninsula in April. Heretofore, Lee had held strictly to the defensive, in order that the South might gather strength. Now, looking beyond the relief of Richmond, Lee for the first time could consider a new phase of the war, an offensive defensive at a distance from Richmond. The immediate success of such a change of policy depended not merely on good strategy but also on the mental attitude of the Georgia and Carolina people. The president, of course, could order the brigades northward, and they would come, but could a new government, dependent on the support of sovereign states, afford to risk a panic or to create the impression that Virginia was being defended at the expense of her sisters? The influences that were to thwart the efforts of the administration in later attempts to effect large-scale concentration were already operative and had to be taken into account. The southern states were allies, not a united nation, and the conduct of military operations was subject to nearly all the difficulties, save that of language, that weaken most alliances. Would they have the larger vision now? Were the much-cherished states' rights, which were so potent a factor in leading the South to declare its independence, to prove an obstacle to the attainment of that independence? Chapter 9, Lee as the King of Spades while Davis undertook to negotiate for the transfer of troops from the South Atlantic states, in order that Jackson might invade Pennsylvania, Lee gave himself for a few days to expediting the construction of the defenses and to improving the Army's discipline and organization. It was not easy work. Many of the soldiers had never done manual labor. In many cases even privates had their body servants to perform their menial duties about the camp. Scorning the shelter of fortifications as unworthy of gentlemen at arms, the troops were not disposed to construct them. Much they grumbled at the orders of their engineer general, the King of Spades, as they dubbed him. One element of the press was equally antagonistic. General Jackson's two maxims carpeed the Richmond examiner to fight whenever it is possible and in fighting to take it once and furiously are worth all the ditches and spades that General Lee can display on the side of the Chickahominy. Lee was puzzled and provoked at this attitude. Our people are opposed to work, he told President Davis, our troops, officers, community and press. All ridicule and resist it. It is the very means by which McClellan has been and is advancing. Combined with valor, fortitude and boldness, of which we have our fair proportion, it should lead us to success. What carried the Roman soldiers into all countries but this happy combination? The evidences of their labor last to this day. There is nothing so military as labor, and nothing so important to an army as to save the lives of its soldiers. Thus convinced, he did not stand back because of antagonism or doubting minds. Almost daily he went out to the lines, encouraging the soldiers and complimenting them on their progress. Soon they began to take pride in his praise and looked for his visits. The works began to rise satisfactorily, not a strong line compared with that which girdled Richmond in 1864 but ample for the immediate purpose. Fortification was continued until the eve of the Battle of Mechanicsville, but after the first two weeks of June, Lee felt no further concern regarding it. The Federals at the same time were digging furiously, felling timber in front of their defenses, building bridges, and constantly watching Confederate movements from their observation balloons. To stiffen the discipline and improve the organization of the army was a task even more difficult. The obstacles were manifold. Perhaps if he reflected in his active life on his reading of Everett's Life of Washington in the winter of 1861-1862, Lee saw the parallel between his condition and that of Washington in 1776, as pictured by the biographer. The position of affairs was one of vast responsibility and peril. The country at large was highly excited and expected that a bold stroke would be struck and decisive successes won.
but the army was without organization and discipline, the troops in use to obey, the officers for the most part unaccustomed, some of them incompetent to command. A few of them only had had a limited experience in the Seven Years' War. Most of the men had rushed to the field on the first alarm of hostilities, without any enlistment, and when they were enlisted, it was only till the end of the year. There was no military chest, scarce anything that could be called a commissariat. The artillery consisted of a few old field pieces of various sizes, served with a very few exceptions by persons wholly untrained in gunnery. In some of its aspects, discipline had been lax under Johnston, drunkenness had been frequent, many things were at loose ends. Some of the regiments reported a third of the troops sick. Lee worked as fast as he could to improve the condition of the men. The commissary and the quartermaster's service were improved. Favoritism in granting details for service in the rear was ended. Before he had been two weeks in the field, a friendly Richmond newspaper noted, since General Lee has assumed command many things had been done for the benefit of the public service and the soldier individually which have been overlooked or neglected. The Federals, of course, were not aware at this time of what Lee was doing toward the improvement of discipline, but later they were fully conscious of the effects. One northern correspondent wrote after the seven days, the shell, which wounded. General Johnston, although it confused the rebels, was the saddest shot fired during the war. It changed the entire rebel tactics. It took away incompetence, indecision and dissatisfaction and gave skillful generalship, excellent plans and good discipline. Before the Battle of Fair Oaks, rebel troops were sickly, half-fed and clothed, and had no hearts for their work. After Lee took command, the troops improved in appearance. Cadaverous looks became rare among prisoners. The discipline became better, they went into battles with shouts, and without being urged, and, when in, fought like tigers. A more marked change for the better never was made in any body of men than that wrought in his army by the sensible actions of General Lee. The labors to which Federals paid tribute took many hours of the busy days of June. Lee was ceaselessly astir. Not only did he have to supervise a hundred undertakings on the line, but he had to direct, in some measure, those distant operations that had been under his care when he was assigned to field duty. The army of Kirby Smith in Tennessee continued for some weeks to be his special charge. In dealing with the officers, Lee proceeded as though there was no opposition to him. The day after he took command he summoned all the generals to a council of war at a place on the Nine Mile Road styled the chimneys. Smith had left the army with some obscure nervous ailment. The other division commanders were somewhat scandalized at what they considered in caution on Lee's part in discussing a plan of operations in the presence of the brigadiers. They might as well have spared their feelings. Lee simply asked for opinions on the state of affairs and listened as the brigade commanders reported. One by one they took the floor. When the turn of General W. H. C. Whiting came, his gloomy temperament displayed itself. As he was describing how McClellan's long-range guns would make it possible for him to hammer his way into Richmond, President Davis came into the room and quietly took a seat. Whiting kept on, mathematically demonstrating his thesis. Stop, stop, said Lee, if you go deciphering we are whipped beforehand. Davis took heart from the warning. Presently D. H. Hill made a humorous observation on an unmilitary remark by General Robert Toombs and the conversation drifted into less serious channels. Lee at length bade his lieutenants good day without the slightest intimation of what he intended to do. The generals rode away none the wiser for their conference, some of them assured of Lee's ability, others convinced that he had simply called them together to see what manner of men they were. He could hardly have been disappointed in them as a group. The policy of the administration, while sustained in previous months by Johnston's persistent appeal for trained men, had put at the disposal of Lee an unusual number of professional soldiers of high intelligence. Counting those who were yet to join him, Lee was to go into the Seven Days Battle with 49 general officers, whose average age was slightly over 40 years. Thirty-one of these were West Point graduates, and only a handful could be accounted as political generals in the accepted northern use of that unhappy term. Thirteen were to be major generals and twelve lieutenant generals. Sixteen were to be killed or were to die of wounds, thirteen were to share with Lee the last dreadful hours of Appomattox.
17 came from Virginia, 8 from North Carolina, and 7 from Georgia. In addition to Longstreet, A. P. Hill, and a few others who were to be in daily association with their chief, the council and the camps then contained many interesting personalities, some of them soldiers who were not to sustain the reputation they then enjoyed, others of them fated to rise to high position by valor and by skill. Magruder has already been introduced. Benjamin Huger, commanding a division, has been observed at Norfolk ere its evacuation. He was comparatively an old man by the standard of that youthful army, being 56. Behind him were some of the finest Huguenot traditions of South Carolina, as well as connection with the great house of Pinckney. Among Huger's brigade generals were three unusual men. L. A. Armistead, son of a general in the War of 1812 and himself an Indian fighter of distinction, was destined to play a conspicuous part in Malvern Hill and to fall the next year in a dramatic hour at Gettysburg. William Mahone was a small, wiry man of 36 who had already established his reputation as an imaginative consolidator of railroads, the southern harriman of his day. Ambrose R. Wright, of Georgia, was a lawyer and a political general, but he was to justify by hard blows the confidence of his people who, when he had enlisted as a private, had forthwith elected him a colonel. He was never to be a brilliant soldier, but he was to exhibit a noble fidelity. In Magruder's conglomerate command, one division was under a stocky, bearded Georgian, Lafayette McClaws, a West Pointer and a veteran of the Mexican War, whose name was to be linked with Longstreet's until an unhappy disagreement. The most interesting of McClaws's brigadiers at this time was a magnificent South Carolinian, Joseph B. Kershaw, a lawyer, who had been chosen to lead Bonham's famous brigade. The nervous, impetuous A. P. Hill had excellent brigadiers. One of them, Charles W. Field, of Kentucky, then 42, was to be transferred to Longstreet and, at the very end of the war, was to have the honor of leading on the field of surrender the largest division that survived the last ordeal. Maxie Gregg of South Carolina, another of Hill's brigadiers, was to win in Homeric fame at 2nd Manassas and was to fall at Fredericksburg, cheering a wild counterattack. Still another brigadier of this division was the small, vigorous, and soldierly William D. Pender of North Carolina, a classmate of Custis Lee's and of Jeb Stewart's. He was only 28 and he had won his wreath and his three stars by his able leading of the 6th North Carolina at Seven Pines. He was to receive his mortal wound at Gettysburg before he had attained the full measure of his potential achievements. The brigades of Longstreet's division were well served. At the head of one was a Virginian of 37, a romantic person, who loved to wear his hair in ringlets. He was to give his name to the most famous charge of the war, Georgie Pickett. Cadmus M. Wilcox, 32, was a slow, meticulous, and scholarly soldier, an authority on rifle fire. Dick Anderson, then 41, was the most brilliant but at the same time the most erratic of the group, a soldier all his life and one of the witnesses of the initial tragedy at Fort Sumter. In Whiting's division was a physically magnificent brigadier of 31, John B. Hood, who had been a lieutenant of cavalry in Lee's old regiment, a man of great activity on the field, but more sociable than diligent off it. The prince of the South Carolina planters, Wade Hampton, a powerful man of 44, had just been promoted brigadier general and was limping from the wound received at Seven Pines. Busy with their commands on the lines around Richmond were a host of others whose names were to have eminence, e. Porter Alexander, then acting chief of ordnance and soon to be the most brilliant of all Lee's artillerists, John B. Gordon, not yet thirty, and the diligent commander of the 6th Alabama, Samuel McGowan, who was to be Maxie Gregg's successor and was then the colonel of the 14th South Carolina, John R. Cook, 29, a Harvard man, a civil engineer and commander of the 27th. North Carolina, soon to win a glorious name at Sharpsburg, W. T. Wofford of the 18th Georgia, who was to develop into one of the most capable of all Lee's brigadiers, these were only a few. Young R. F. Hoke, Stephen D. Ramser, and A. M. Scales were all of them at this time colonels of North Carolina regiments, the queer, cynical Jubal A. Early, West Pointer by training but prosecuting attorney by impulse and choice, was absent, wounded. So was another and younger officer of much capacity, R.D. E. Rhodes. Nearly all the men who were later to be Lee's renowned cavalry commanders were colonels at the time, and the youthful John Pelham was a captain of the horse artillery attached to Stuart.
with surprising rapidity, considering their devotion to Johnston and their secret disdain of the staff, nearly all of these officers were won over to Lee's support by his manner, his energy, and his modest but unmistakable willingness to assume the responsibilities of leadership. He neither flattered them nor dealt with them austerely, but they could not fail to see that he knew his duty and was determined to discharge it, regardless of their opinion of him. He was careful in his appointments to fill vacancies, studiously just in his judgment of qualifications and unwilling to recommend officers of whose ability he was doubtful. One thing helped him greatly, the confidence imposed in him by those who knew him well. Major E. P. Alexander, for instance, chanced to be riding with Colonel Joseph Ives, who had been Lee's engineer in South Carolina and was now on President Davis's staff. They fell to talking of Lee. Ives, said Alexander, tell me this. We are here fortifying our lines, but apparently leaving the enemy all the time he needs to accumulate his superior forces and then to move on us in the way he thinks best. Has General Lee the audacity that is going to be required for our inferior force to meet the enemy's superior force, to take the aggressive and run risks and take chances? Ives reined in his horse, stopped, and turned to his companion. Alexander, he said, if there is one man in either army, Confederate or Federal, head and shoulders above every other in audacity, it is General Lee. His name might be Audacity. He will take more desperate chances, and take them quicker than any other general in this country, north or south, and you will live to see it, too. Such confidence begot confidence. Before Lee had progressed far in preparing for the offensive against McClellan, it became apparent that no such reinforcements as Jackson would require for the invasion of Pennsylvania could be expected from the South Atlantic seaboard. Brigadier General A. R. Lawton had a large Georgia brigade that he was anxious to bring to Virginia and he started northward. But at Charleston, General Pemberton talked of the danger of an attack on his line and was so involved in disagreements with some of his officers that a movement was on foot to have him removed to another command. Large detachments from that quarter might break the morale of the Palmetto State. A proposal to send Green North Carolina troops to Charleston to take the place of more seasoned regiments that might be ordered to Virginia disclosed the fact that Governor Clark felt some resentment because Holmes's brigades had been summarily dispatched to the Richmond Front. The War Department continued its efforts to get troops from South Carolina and from Alabama as well, but Lee had to abandon his project for an invasion of Pennsylvania almost as soon as he formulated it. He determined, however, to send Lawton, upon his arrival from Georgia, to reinforce Jackson. We must aid a gallant man if we perish, said he. Beyond this, he had not decided what should be undertaken in the valley when, on June 8, he received an important letter from Jackson. His forces, the valley commander reported, were so disposed that if Shields attempted to advance and join Fremont, the federal column would have to cross his front. If, Jackson went on, his command was required at Richmond, he could have part of his troops at the railroad after one day's march. At present, he said, I do not see that I can do much more than rest my command and devote its time to drilling. Lee reasoned that if this were Jackson's prospect, reinforcements would be lost on him, consequently he at once wrote Jackson to rest his men and to be prepared to move to Richmond, but meantime should an opportunity occur for striking the enemy a successful blow, do not let it escape you. The date on which he might summon Jackson was left open, because the Richmond defenses were not yet completed, and Lee did not intend to undertake an offensive until the works were ready. The next morning, June 9, there came news that once again changed Lee's plans for the employment of Jackson, under the shadow of the Massanutten Mountain, Jackson had struck Fremont at Cross Keys and had halted him, bewildered. Ere Lee got this report, the other wing of Jackson's army had grappled furiously with Shields' advance guard at Port Republic and had hurled it back, bloody and crippled, on the main force. As these twin battles of great tactical brilliance definitely gave Jackson the advantage again, Lee instantly decided to make the most of it. He ordered Lawton's brigade and a few North Carolina regiments united at once with Jackson's force and he began immediately to ponder the possibilities of the general situation. McClellan was working on his bridges and his fortifications, but as the roads remained impassable, there was no immediate threat of an advance. Lee still had no way of sending Jackson enough men to undertake the cherished project of a great offensive in Pennsylvania, but he had learned something from the quick recall of McDowell after Jackson had defeated Banks.
he had made a discovery, in fact, that was to influence his strategy many times in the next two years and on occasion was to shape it, President Lincoln, he perceived, was easily alarmed for the safety of Washington. Any Confederate movement that threatened the federal capital would be apt to prompt Mr. Lincoln to call troops from Virginia to its defense. This Lee had found out. Might it not be possible, then, to dispatch to Jackson a few more brigades from the Army of Northern Virginia? With these, might not Jackson undertake a short, sharp offensive that would crush the enemy in his front and so alarm the Northern President that McDowell's army would be summoned to Washington? With the valley cleared, Jackson might then move swiftly to Richmond and join in the attack on McClellan. Even if only a part of McDowell's force were recalled to Washington, while the rest joined McClellan, a diversion by Jackson, followed by a quick march of his troops to Richmond, might give Lee sufficient strength to hope for a victory in the field. Such a plan involved risks, of course, but how was Richmond to be saved by a numerically inferior force, without taking risks? Rain came on the night of June 9 and continued through the 10th, a blessed downfall because it meant that the naturally hesitant McClellan would be chained to his positions for several days longer. As the rain poured down, Lee debated the reinforcement of Jackson and by the evening of June 10, he reached his decision, he would send Jackson eight strong regiments besides Lawton's brigade and the North Carolina detachment, with these Jackson could attack and defeat the enemy, and then, by the time the earthworks were finished, he could be near Richmond. It doubtless was futile to hope that such a large-scale troop movement to the Valley of Virginia could be concealed from McClellan's spies in Richmond, therefore it might as well be capitalized. If the troops moved boldly away, in open daylight, Lincoln would hear of it and would be more alarmed than ever for the safety of Washington. McDowell would be less disposed to move southward, though he would be unable to reinforce the valley in time to check Jackson. McClellan would reason that if Lee could afford to send off two brigades, he was too strong to be attacked. On June 11, Lee detached Whiting, with eight regiments of that officer's own selection, ordered the men through Richmond to the Richmond and Danville station, and sent a staff officer thither to create the impression that much importance was attached to the speedy departure of the reinforcements in order that an offensive might be launched in the valley. Lest the enemy might suspect the true nature of the ruse, he took pains to see that the Richmond newspapers said nothing, one way or the other. Jackson's orders were explicit, the object, Lee wrote, is to enable you to crush the forces opposed to you. This done, Jackson was to leave in the valley his weaker infantry units, his cavalry and his artillery, in order to screen the movement and to guard the passes. With the rest of his troops, including Ewell, Lawton, and Whiting, he was to move eastward by the Virginia Central Railroad and was to assail McClellan's right flank while Lee attacked in front. As the bridges on the Virginia Central Railroad between Richmond and Hanover Junction had been burned by federal raiders, Whiting moved by way of Buckville, Lynchburg, and Charlottesville. After his departure, Lee at once turned to preparations for the offensive that was to be undertaken when Jackson arrived. The first step was to procure exact information concerning McClellan's position and line of communications. The Federal left, which was too strong to be turned, had been accurately located. It was covered by White Oak Swamp, a sluggish stream that ran into the Chickahominy through a marshy, overflowed bottom from a point two and a half miles south of Seven Pines. The center, running northward to the Chickahominy, was in plain view and was also very strong. But there was some doubt how far north of the Chickahominy the federal right extended. Communications manifestly were maintained with the White House, on the Pamunkey, via the Richmond and York River Railroad. It was suspected, moreover, that the right was being supplied by a wagon train running northward from the White House and thence by the Piping Tree Road to the Old Church Road and on to McClellan's lines. The existence of these communications needed to be established, and if they were in use, they should be destroyed or, at the least, interrupted. To ascertain the facts, Lee determined to order a cavalry raid to the rear of McClellan's right, and for this purpose on June 11 called to headquarters Brigadier General J. E. B. Stewart, now at the head of the cavalry. This picturesque young officer had reached the mature age of 29. He had seen little of his old West Point superintendent during the first year of the war and as recently as January, 1862, had privately admitted that Lee had disappointed him as a general, but now, when Lee explained what was desired, he entered joyfully into the plan for a reconnaissance in the rear of McClellan's army and confided to his chief that he believed he could ride entirely around the federal forces.
Li was in no position to risk the loss of his cavalry, and after talking with Stuart, he gave him lengthy instructions written in his own hand, explaining the information he desired and cautioning him against too great exposure of his men. Be content, said he, to accomplish all the good you can without feeling it necessary to obtain all that might be desired. Enough cavalry must be left to serve the army. And remember, Li admonished, that one of the chief objects of your expedition is to gain intelligence for the guidance of future operations. Because of the plans he was already making to bring Jackson from the valley, Li particularly instructed Stuart to examine the watershed of Totopotomoy Creek, down which Jackson was apt to advance. He intimated to Stuart, also, that a threat against McClellan's communications would probably lead the federal commander to detach troops to defend them, thereby reducing his frontline strength. As happily as if starting on a honeymoon, young Stuart picked some 1,200 men from his cavalry regiments and disappeared up Brook Road with them on the 12th, pretending that he was bound for the valley to support Whiting and to reinforce Jackson. He had chosen some of his best lieutenants for the honor of the great adventure, Rooney Lee, now Colonel of the 9th Virginia Cavalry, Colonel Fitz Lee of the 1st, and Lieutenant Colonel W. T. Martin of the Jeff Davis Legion. A gigantic German officer of bewildering apparel, Heroes von Bork, rode as aide, Lieutenant James Breathed had a section of the horse artillery under his charge, and a sharp-visaged, wiry young man, John S. Mosby, rode along, half-aide, half-courier, unattached and uncommissioned, but exhibiting already some of the qualities that were to make him the most renowned of all the partisan rangers. Promising youngsters, all of them, but reckless fellows. There was no telling what they might attempt, once they were on those narrow, sandy roads of Hanover, with the Union cavalry lurking in the woods. Other concerns now crowded Lee's mind, along with that for Stuart. There were evidences that McClellan was being reinforced. Burnside was known to have joined him, though it was not certain that any of his troops had come with Burnside from North Carolina. Belated word came on the 14th that federal transports had gone up the Rappahannock to Fredericksburg and that at least one large steamer had descended the river, jammed with soldiers, bound presumably from McDowell to McClellan. Sickness was taking thousands of men from McClellan's lines, according to Lee's information, but the troops from McDowell and other recruits would more than balance the account. Besides, the fickle weather had turned Unionist again. There had been no rain since the 10th. The sun was beating down in a typical Virginia hot spell, and the roads were drying as fast. This meant, of course, that McClellan would soon be able to advance his heavy guns, despite the railway battery, which was not yet ready for service. Whatever was done by Jackson in the valley must be done quickly, for every man that he could spare would soon be needed on the Richmond front. For these reasons, June 14th was a day of anxiety. Before it ended, there arrived an exhausted courier, in the person of Corporal Turner Doswell, with a message from Stuart, the first to be received from that daredevil since he had started on the reconnaissance. And what a message it was! Stuart had ridden to McClellan's rear, had destroyed a wagon train, had captured some 165 men and more than that number of horses, with only one casualty, and had circled entirely around the rear of the Federal Army, precisely as he had said he believed he could do. On reaching the Chickahominy, more than 30 miles below Richmond, he found the ford so deep and so swift that Fitzley had nearly lost his life in crossing it. There was no bridge and no other ford close by. Stuart was on the far side of the stream when Doswell left, and all his men were with him. He had, however, been quite confident he would get back to the Confederate lines and he had directed Doswell to request Lee to make a diversion on the Charles City Road so that the Federals would not be able to send a force to cut him off as he returned to Richmond. A man less self-controlled than Lee would have sworn because Stuart had taken such chances and he would have resolved inwardly to bring that reckless dragoon to court-martial if he escaped with his life. As it was, Lee said nothing and could do nothing, at that hour, to relieve the raiders. He must wait until morning to make the diversion. With the dawn of the 15th, Stuart himself rode up to headquarters. His finery was much bedraggled and even his iron frame was weary, but he was triumphant and full of information. After he had sent off Doswell, said Stuart, he had found the skeleton of a burned bridge a mile below the ford, had repaired this and had crossed the entire command. The column, undisturbed, was moving toward Richmond under Colonel Fitz Lee. Stuart had ridden ahead of it to report.
During the course of the raid, Stuart went on to say he had encountered Lee's old regiment, the 2D Cavalry, now the 5th, and his pursuers, who had easily been outdistanced, had belonged to the command of his own father-in-law, Brigadier General Philip St. George Cook. There was much more, however, than adventure and Elon about the raid. To Stuart's report of the ground and of the federal dispositions, Lee gave instant and serious ear. The roads behind the federal lines, Stuart said, were worse than those on the Confederate front. That was encouraging because it meant that McClellan's movements would be slow. Secondly, Stuart reported, there was no doubt that the Federals were supplying their lines by wagon trains from the vicinity of the White House, as well as by the railroad. There were no signs of any intention on McClellan's part to change his base to James River. All this indicated, of course, that if the Confederates could turn the Federal right, they might get on McClellan's line of communications. Perhaps they might even cut him off from his base. Finally, Stewart had invaluable information concerning the state of affairs on McClellan's right. Beyond the headwaters of Beaver Dam Creek, he had found no Federals on the long ridge that Lee had especially enjoined him to examine. There was nothing, so far as Stewart could see, to keep Jackson from turning Beaver Dam Creek and sweeping on down toward the White House. That was news, indeed. It justified all the risks that Stewart had taken. Realizing that McClellan might be alarmed by Stewart's raid and might strengthen his right wing, Lee at once had his infantry feel out the federal front to see if it had been weakened. Finding no evidence of this, Lee's hopes of a successful offensive rose, and with them his satisfaction over Stewart's exploit. He commended Stewart and his troops in general orders, taking good pains not to mention his son and his nephew, whom Stewart had warmly praised and had recommended for promotion. From that time forward, Lee trusted the discretion of Stuart. That bold young cavalry commander was to become, in more than a metaphor, the eyes of the army.